All right, welcome. Um, so I'm gonna call to order the City Council joint meeting with our Parks and Rec Commission. Um, it is now 5.30 actually, Tuesday, September 13th. Um, I'll have our City Clerk do the roll call. Mayor Kaylee Clark. Here. Deputy Mayor Amy Lamb. Here. Councilmember Karen Howe. Here. Councilmember Kent Treen. Present. Councilmember Pamela Stewart. Here. Councilmember Ratuja Indapure. Councilmember Roisin O'Farrell. Present. And Parks Commissioners Emily Snyder, Cheryl Wagner, Tracy Smith. Here. Sid Gupta. Here. Hank Klein. Here. Melanie Kelsey. Here. Dina Ann. Here. Nancy Way. Here. And Mark Perry. He might be on the Zoom. Let me look here. Oh, yeah, I got to promote him. Okay, I'm promoting Mr. Perry. Here he is. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank Great. you very much. Back to you, Mayor. Thank you. All right, thank you. And I believe Councilmember Indapure is actually traveling on her way home. Uh, um, do we need a motion for Mayor, if I may, uh, she is trying to get on, says oh. she's having a couple tech issues. Perfect, cool, thank you. Yeah, so she will be here soon, I hope. Uh, so next we have Pledge of Allegiance. Councilmember Stewart, if you'll do that. All right, thank you. Um, so, Councilmember Treen, do you mind doing the land acknowledgement? Oh, sorry, it is on our, do you want this? Sorry, uh, or that. Land acknowledgement. Our land acknowledgement is a statement we read to recognize indigenous peoples who are the original stewards of the lands on which we now live, work, and recreate. The city is a proud partner of the Snoqualmie tribe, and we feel it is important to recognize the history and connection tribes have always had to these lands. Therefore, we will now read our statement. We acknowledge that we are the indigenous are on the indigenous lands of the Coastal Salish people who have uh, reserved treaty rights to this land, specifically the Snoqualmie Indian tribe. We thank these caretakers of this land who have lived and continue to live here since time immemorial. Great, thank you. Next, I'll entertain a motion for approval of the agenda. I move we approve the agenda. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? I think that's an aye. Um, so by 7-0, uh, agenda is approved. Next, I'll open it up for public comment. I think we'll start, okay, in the room. Um, so first up, we have Joyce Bottenberg. Um, Madam Mayor, both of these commenters have submitted PowerPoints ahead of time, so I'm going to try to get them up on the screen. And slide one to begin. <laughs> I'm Joyce Bottenberg. I've been a resident here since 1986. I'm representing the local nonprofit organization, Sammamish Friends. We formed in 2012 out of the Parks Commission. Since our founding, we've met every month focusing on positive engagement in environmental stewardship and community development. Our tagline is protecting our environment and enriching our community. As a 501c3 nonprofit, we act as an umbrella organization, providing structural and financial support to the many local groups that are helping shape Sammamish. These include the Stormwater Stewards, Sammamish Walks, and newly Sammamish Seniors. Slide two, please. We wanted to speak tonight to provide a quick report on the 2022 Kids Mud Run. In 2016, when we started, we hosted around 200 runners. This year, our fourth iteration, the Mud Run, our count was 483. 
by far our biggest ever. The Mud Run is entirely volunteer driven. We could not have put this together without our partners throughout Sammamish. Sammamish Rotary was a huge help to us, both in setting up and running of the event. Athletes for Kids were a big help with setting up. We received support from Kiwanis. The Boys and Girls Club hosted a table at the finish line. Eastside Fire and Rescue manned our hose off station. And we had a great variety of community sponsors. And the city provided a tremendous amount of support to us. The Mud Run truly is a community event, and we wanted to thank everyone who played a part in helping us put it together. When we hosted the first Mud Run, we did it with the goal of promoting health and wellness in kids through physical activity. But we think it's also important to remember, slide three, please, that we, that we can all be kids at heart. Thank you again to the community for your support. We hope to see you all again next year. Thank you. Thank you, that was awesome. <laughs> um, all right, next I have Dorothy. Hello everyone, um, I'm Dorothy Weissman. I am, live at 1017 221st Avenue Southeast, Sammamish. I have lived in Sammamish since 1998. Um, if you can, I live directly behind uh, or in the kitty corner of Big Rock Park in what is known as Lancaster Ridge. You can go to the first slide. I wanted to talk to you guys because I know you're making a decision about parks today. And I feel like we have a really um, flawed design in the parking lot at Big Rock North. Um, my understanding is this parking lot was done um, to mitigate costs. Uh, the parking was put along the street, as you can see there. If you can go to the next slide. Can I, I don't know if I can do it myself, but. Um, so this is an aerial view. You can see that there's no uh, actual barrier between the street and the parking. Um, if you go to the next slide, it looks like when you drive up, you're actually just driving into a parking lot, nothing out of the ordinary. You're just gonna drive into your regular parking lot, you're gonna go to the park, you got your kids, you got your dog, whatnot. That's great, except for the fact that, if you can go to the next slide, that parking lot does not stand alone. It is part of a street. And if you go to the next slide, you can see where the parking lot is located and how much of the street is actually past the parking lot. If you go to the next slide, you can see that there's actually an 18 house subdivision that has that is currently being built at the end of that road. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see where that 18 house subdivision is going. Um, 18 huge 4,000 square foot houses. We can talk about the subdivision itself if you like, but that's a whole different topic. But there is a ton of people moving right in that little circle right there at the end of this road past that parking lot. Go to the next slide. So the current issues right now with this parking lot are that cars back directly up into the street. I drive this parking lot several times a day to get to my house and out, as do all of my neighbors, as will all of the people that live in those 18 huge big houses with extended families and kids. This, the cars do not realize that this is not just a parking lot. It is a street. They back right out, don't even look. They unload their cars. The traffic on Southeast 8th is only going to increase with Big Rock Vista. It is d over doubling the number of houses. And these are new houses with new families that are bigger than the, than the families that live in the existing houses there. Okay, they unload and load in that area. Big tailgates open, these are big cars. They don't fit all the way into those parking spots. So they're in the street unloading, okay? We're gonna develop Big Rock Park, and if you all do your job great, which is good, it'll be a really exciting place to go. You're gonna have a ton of people coming into Beaton Hill Park and this side of Big Rock Park and increase the traffic there tremendously. So it's unsafe, there are no lights, there are no gates, there is late night activity there, and the police will verify that. Thank you so I much. I really need you to do parking off the street at Big Rock. So Thank option you. three, please, just for the parking. All right, thank you. Do I have anyone else? Is there an opportunity later to see? I think you can go. You're definitely welcome. Yeah. Uh, just to clarify, there there's another public comment period, but that's for the next for the portion, meeting. the special meeting okay. portion. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Sorry. Uh, we're good in the room, correct? Yes, and we also have the, just have to check for the online, if there's any online commenters. Okay, so, so for clarification, there's public comment for the council meeting after this. Right. Yes. Okay, so if you wish to provide comment, please raise your hand. If you are calling by phone, press star nine. Let's see. Okay, we have, we have one person so far that will promote. Mr. Stickney. Hello, city council members and and parks commissioners. The only comment that I have is, is this overall process for the master plan on these uh, two parks has been going on for roughly six months. And I understand the concept. I attended the open house. I like a, a lot of it. But the comment I have this evening is, it seems inappropriate to not have some scoping concept costs associated with the three plans for each of the parks. If this was only a couple weeks into the process, I could understand that, but how do you sort of decide what are the right features, et cetera, and not have some rough concept costs associated with the uh, trade-off of cost to some of those items. So my advice is on these types of things in the future, when they're reasonably far along in the process, that there doesn't have to be exact costs, but it seems to me that there should be some scoping costs associated with each of the alternatives to be a part of the process to discuss how all that shakes out. So that's my only comment on this part, and I look forward to hearing the presentation, and I like the work so far, short of not knowing what some of the costs are. Great, thank you. Okay, I see no more uh, public commenters. Back to you, Madam Mayor. Awesome, thank you. All right, so next we'll move into our joint meeting with the Parks and Rec uh, Commission. Uh, so am I handing this to Anjali? Yes, I'll be promoting oh, also yeah, the participants. Awesome. All right. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council, Parks and Recreation Commission, Mr. City Manager, and members of the public. I'm Anjali Maya, Director of Parks, Recreation, and Facilities, and it is my pleasure to introduce the topic for tonight's joint meeting, which is the presentation of the programming and concept alternatives for the Beaton Hill Park and Big Rock Park South Master Plan Project. Earlier this year, we came to you to learn your hopes, dreams, and concerns for these parks, and we did the same with the community. This evening, our consultant will present three different concepts for your comment and feedback. These concepts have been shared with the community and our Parks Commission as our advisory board has also had the opportunity to see them briefly. We have printed copies of these concepts in front of you for your easy reference. I'm joined tonight by staff members Kevin Teague, our deputy director, Shelby Peralt, our project manager, and Alicia Parks, our admin assistant, the city's consultant, Juliet Vong from HBB Landscape Architecture, and we have with us Mary Piggott, who generously donated Big Rock Park to the city. Thank you, Mary, for making the time to be here this evening, and I will turn it over to Shelby to take it from here. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council and Commission, and Interim City Manager. As Anjali mentioned, we are here tonight to present concept alternatives for the master plans of Beaton Hill Park and Big Rock Park South. Also joining us virtually this evening is Julia Baki with HBB Landscape Architecture and Deepa um, Surendranath with Reluda Architects. And before starting our presentation, I'd like to welcome Mary Piggott up to the podium so that she can share a few words about her vision in donating the Big Rock Park parcels.
Thank you. Um, I'm Mary Piggott, and I want to say thank you to everybody for giving me a few moments to uh, say a few words to you all about my gift to the city and the residents of Sammamish. And please excuse me, because I'm going to cry. <laughs> um, over many years, my family and I enjoyed these 50 acres of woods, ponds, and creeks up here on the plateau. I cannot begin to express my joy when I see so many of my former neighbors now enjoying the properties. It's, I'm thrilled to know that in this increasingly built region, we continue to find value in nature. We continue to find the gifts of nature. It's my fervent wish that these parcels, two of which are open to the public and the final one, which is what we're talking about tonight, retain to a great extent the undeveloped nature they had when I gifted them. I hope the theme of undeveloped nature is maintained in Big Rock South. The many modest improvements to both Big Rock North and Big Rock Central are absolutely consistent with my vision and with that nature. And I love the community input processes which have been used to influence these changes. I just wanna thank you again for your thoughtful stewardship of the parks, now including Big Rock South. I still can't get quite used to that, but thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. So the purpose of tonight's presentation is to receive preliminary input on programming and concept alternatives for both Beaton Hill and Big Rock Park South. Juliet and I will be both presenting this evening. I will start out with introducing the sites and walking through existing conditions, and then we'll hand it off to Juliet to walk through our outreach summary from April, as well as our project goals and concept alternatives, and then provide an overview of our most recent outreach and lead the discussion portion of this evening. So starting off with introductions, um, to help orient everyone, uh, Beaton Hill Park and Big Rock Park South are centrally located within the city's core. Beaton Hill Park is half a mile west of uh, Sammamish Commons and our town center boundary, and is across the street from the three Big Rock Park properties, which are all interconnected and terminate at Southeast 20th Street. Where we are in the process, we completed our site investigation and analysis in April and are now in the park programming phase. Tonight, we have goals and concept alternatives for discussion. And following this evening, we will narrow down our concepts into one preferred plan for each park. Once we reach consensus on a preferred plan, we then move into the SEPA process. And at the end of the SEPA process is a final master plan with a deliverable being a report. For existing conditions, oops, excuse me, there we go, okay. Oops, pardon my technology. <laughs> Uh, Beaton Hill Park is characterized by open meadows and rolling hills on the south part of the site and steeper slopes on the northern portion of the property. Um, there is also a tree preservation area which is filled in red and this is designated for permanent conservation. And then Big Rock South um, has gardens around the residence, an established network of trails similar to the other two Big Rock Park properties and it has um, flat, relatively open meadows throughout the property as well. And then we have a number of structures on the site. So anything from a pool house, we have the single family residences, um, two garages, one older and one newer, and then a large barn. And then with that, I'll hand it off to Juliet. share so that you guys can hear me. So apologize for that. Um, all right, so we're going to talk through some of the early outreach that we've received um, before we go into the concepts and the alternatives. Um, we started off our process with uh, really a visioning exercise that uh, we held at a pop-up uh, during the Earth Day event. 
um, back in April. And then we followed that up with a virtual public workshop and an online survey concurrently um, also in April. So we had kind of a good amount of input right off the bat to really talk about the community's hopes, dreams, and concerns. You can see in the word cloud some of the activities that we had, people writing on boards and giving us some great feedback and being able to talk one-on-one -on -one was really wonderful. Um, the hopes and dreams listed here is kind of a very high-level summary, um, and a lot of what you're going to see in the master plans came from that summary. So we took the ideas and the hopes and the dreams, we turned that into programmatic, programmatic opportunities, and then looked at how those would fit on the site to generate the alternatives you're going to talk about today. You can see here we had 184 survey participants, so that's at the online survey. That way people could come in person. They could visit us during the set virtual time, but they could also go online and give us input at any time uh, for the few weeks that that survey was active. Um, most people lived uh, within Sammamish and 20% with a half mile of the park. Um, besides just the hopes and dreams, we also asked people to think about the values um, that they perceive and to really help us prioritize those values as they think about the future development of the parks. And so that gives us really a sense of not just what's important to the community to generate the vision and the goals, but also how to compare those different alternatives against these value statements and the priorities and the importance of those value statements that we heard from the community. And you can see here, similar to Ms. Pickett, retaining that natural character is really important to the community. And we've heard that as a very consistent theme throughout the process so far. We've also been asking people throughout the process specific to the buildings themselves. And at that first survey, we really just asked people about the concept of preserving structures on the site. Um, and the vast majority of people really wanted structures uh, to be preserved if they could have active uses and actual programming in them. So preserve them for a purpose, don't preserve them necessarily just for the sake of preserving them is how we interpret that. And then when they had to pick, they picked the pool house and the barn as the most important to preserve based on the structures that they um, see there. And I will say for those of you who might be listening, the pool house does not have a pool. Um, that's a common misconception for those who, who haven't been to the site because it is currently closed off. Um, it is a basically a, could function as a small meeting room um, for what used to at one point be a pool. Um, all right, our goals for Baton Hill and Big Rock is to really just serve as that oasis of nature um, that you've heard about tonight. And so uh, it really wants to be a place of respite. Um, there's a lot of exploration, there's a lot of discovery that happens, there's a lot of opportunity to connect, but also as you go out there, there's some opportunities to educate and really understand that system as well. And then as we think about recreational opportunities, we also want to um, basically balance those recreational opportunities with the, um, with the natural environment around us. Uh, and so safe access to everyone is an important part of that, that is making sure it's accessible, not just physically accessible, but also accessible to ages, abilities, interests. Which brings us to the last one, which is maintaining the flexibility to respond to those interests that we hear through this process, but also thinking about how think the, the sense of place um, changes and how interests change and, and our communities change over time to try and consider that um, as part of the process. Okay, so moving into our programming alternatives. Uh, what we're going to do is go through a series of visuals um, as well as some short descriptions. I'm not going to go through and read all of these. We're just going to flip through them relatively quickly. But they are showing examples of the types of programming opportunities and activities that we integrated into the various concepts. Um, so when we were at the open house, when we were online, we could show people and give people a sense of what we meant by some of the terms that you see on the open house. So different types of play, universal play being very very natural, being really integrated into an environment, having some play elements, but also really a lot of natural spaces as well in hillsides. Some whimsy, um, which you see out there today, which is kind of fun. Um, play nodes really meaning more integrated, but just sort of pockets of interest that can be very playable, regardless of whether you're a kid, an adult, or, or something in between. 
Um, shelters, amphitheaters, open lawn, things that you kind of might imagine. But even with the amphitheaters, it's important to kind of think about the context and the size and the character. So we're not talking like the Gorge Amphitheater. We're talking a smaller, kind of more intimate space, more consistent with the character of the neighborhood. And then as we move into some of the little bit more active types of recreation opportunities, you can see some of the other elements that were brought up in those early hopes, visions, and dreams. And then there's a whole series of different types of gardens when you go out to the spaces now. Um, all of the big rock systems really have a lot of feeling of a cared for landscape and a landscape that really has kind of a purpose and it's very natural and it can be very informal, but it does feel like a series of gardens. And so thinking about that idea of gardens, there's different ways you can approach gardens as well. Um, different ideas for what you could do in the buildings themselves. We got a lot of feedback through that first process of ideas from the community. And so here's some examples of what those would look like. And then the old garage, I'll pause on for just a minute. The old garage from our, our uh, initial analysis and feasibility uh, is, is probably the, the least, uh, in, in the least amount of shape, the least good shape. I'm not sure how to phrase that one. Um, but so the images you're seeing here are the images of reusing the structure or components of the structure, but um, I also wanna be very upfront that the, the old garage itself is not really reused. It's a foundation, partial foundation and more invoking what it could be as opposed to the, using the structure itself. So that's an important thing to note. Uh, the rest of the buildings were all in, in reasonable shape. Okay, so uh, as we talk about these concepts and the alternatives, we wanna leave a lot of opportunity for discussion. Um, so I'm going to flip through them relatively fast and just give you some really high points of each concept. Um, we can have a larger discussion and get into in depth as we go into the discussion portion of this. So feel free to please stop me if I go too fast or if there's questions as we go through this. Um, so we created three alternatives. Um, and then we organize those alternatives around a concept. Um, when we presented this uh, and when we discussed this in the past, as well as when we presented this community, the idea is never to just pick an alternative or pick a concept. The idea is to think about how the different uses on the site interact with each other, what kinds of feelings and opportunities they evoke. Do they actually fit the hopes and dreams? But at the end of the day, we always expect some things to just mix and match. Right? There's no one set opportunity. There's no one right or wrong for how you think about programming on the site. Um, so we look at feasibility, we look at fit, we look at reasonableness of cost. Um, you know, And if there is a, a big disparity in cost, then we bring that forward to talk to you about it. In this case, all of them are reasonably similar in cost. Um, and then, and then really what you like and don't like about each of these concepts was a lot of what the discussion centered around. So the first concept is called the gradient activities. Uh, really as we think about the sites and all of the sites, it is very natural and it feels very natural in Big Rock South. As you move north, you already naturally see the tree house, you see the, the nature play, and then as you get to Beaton Hill, you have some more opportunities to maybe have a little bit more active. So it's just reflecting that sort of gradient that already exists today and what we can do within the sites. So how we organize those sites, Beaton Hill um, is really more about um, a larger pea patch, bringing in an open space and having a little bit larger play utilizing that hillside as well as nature trails throughout. I will also say in all of these concepts, there are slightly different parking configurations. All of them bring parking into the site somewhat, uh, but at different levels for Beaton Hill. And in all of the concepts, when we looked at the existing parking on street, we looked at it from a technical standpoint, a functional standpoint, the usability of that parking. Um, and so what we've seen is in these options where we do show some on street parking remaining, the recommendation is to stripe it and sign it and teach people to use it as a back end so that those doors open onto a protected space instead of the roadway. Um, angled back end would allow us to do that. And then also to, we integrated a turnaround recognizing that it's essentially a dead end. So if you go past all of this, people aren't exactly doing a very legal turn to be able to get around or they're going into some of those neighbors. So those are really the two key elements to making the parking itself safer and function better. And then there would also need to be a series of enhancements to support crossings um, and safety of just movement of people between those parks as well. 
So in this option, gradient of activities, the south stays very passive. It's a series of gardens and trails, gathering spaces, um, really kind of enhancing what's already there and allowing a lot of that very flexible use that you would expect in, in a very passive park environment. All of the concepts do include a disc golf course. Um, there's planning for about nine holes is what fits within the context of the open space um, and with, without impacting a lot of those existing trails. Um, that is to also say and point out that those nine holes do carry forward into Big Rock Central in order to not overwhelm one site and to really work with the trail system that's there. Um, one small portion of trail would likely be removed, but we would offset it with a, a connection that allows the disc golf to occur without conflicts with that trail system. And that is the case for all of the concepts. All of the concepts have trail systems that would interconnect them all and have various elements of nodes or interest or something along that trail system to give it kind of a little bit more of a presence and more of, a, of an interest. And then in this concept, we would save all of the existing structures with the exception of the old garage gets removed entirely so that when you arrive, you really have that sense of openness into, into the park. All of the concepts also integrate a new restroom facility um, and there would be restrooms proposed, one in Big Rock South, as well as one in Beaton Hill and all of these concepts. All right, whimsy and discovery. I probably talked more during that first one than I, I would want to in all the rest of these. It's really about creating a concept and a driver to interconnect all of these along the trail system. This was um, this concept, uh, you can go to the next slide, was very much built on the idea of what you sort of see and discover when you're out in nature and enhancing that with art and education and, and public sort of interest and playful kinds of spaces. So we have um, Beaton Hill being a larger play area, bringing more parking in sight with the pickleball and the amphitheater that you see here. And then going to Big Rock South, uh, we then keep all of the structures. Uh, we integrate a playscape in the southern portion and then really kind of build into that trail system for everywhere else. And then all of the structures remain. Again, that old garage is uh, not quite a remaining structure. But one of the things the parking in this particular concept does is it really elongates that parking so that there's good accessibility to all of those structures if you're going to use them for various types of events. Concept three is called playful space for everyone. Uh, this is the idea that you really do have some very, very whimsical, very fun, um, very playable spaces already. And so how do we just really build on that character throughout the rest of the, the parks? Um, big uh, Beaten Hill is where we integrate the dog park, which we heard a lot about throughout this process. Um, it is about half the size of what you would have now at um, uh, Beaver Lake Park. Uh, for reference, just so you can kind of get a sense of scale. And this is the one concept where we pulled all of the parking off street and have one larger parking lot for Beaton Hill with just a turnaround. You could do this concept and still leave on street in that back end function that you see in those other concepts. So you can mix and match in those parking options as well. Uh, so then Big Rock Park uh, is, brings, because we had more, uh, more uh, parking and other improvements at Beaton Hill, we bring the pea patch in this option down to Big Rock South. And you can see uh, we remove the residence in this option. And the main driver for removing that residence is with the pea patch in this option. We really feel like there wanted to be that universal play opportunity. And so this uh, removing that residence allowed the space to really have a very integrated, very, um, very larger kind of universal sensory play experience. All right, so what we heard from the community uh, we had a public workshop um, and we timed it with the farmer's market uh, so that we could generate a lot of interest and have a lot of really good connections in person. Um, and overall, we heard from just about everybody, the nature trails, the preservation, the open space was very, very heavily supported. We heard a lot about a pea patch and a need for a pea patch. Um, of course, we recognize that there is a pea patch proposed in Klahani Park as well. So we're trying to kind of balance a little bit of that in the discussions, but that it was supported uh, with a slight preference at B 
Peyton Hill, but that they both sites seemed like they were a good a good fit. Plazas and gathering spaces um, had a lot of interest and a lot of support. Just thinking about family activities and places to be able to go. Of course, everyone's coming off COVID and enjoying be around people again, so that had some influence. Um, and that play was heavily supported and the opportunities for play. People were really drawn to some of the photos we had of more unique types of play. Um, things that really sort of seemed interesting and had a real lot of character to it. Um, this is, and I'm gonna qualify this, this is a, a ranking of written comments. So it's not what everybody said, it's the people who chose to take the time to put pen to paper and leave us a comment, this is what they said. And so we took those comments and we were able to tell from what they said whether they supported or potentially opposed certain types of features. So you can see the dog park um, had a lot of support from that, op that workshop. Um, the amphitheater and the play areas all really kind of universal support. There weren't a lot of people that, that spoke against those types of facilities. But as you go down the list, you see disc golf was a little bit more hit and miss. There were most of the people that I had that I talked to um, had a lot of concerns about potential conflicts. Um, not that it wasn't necessarily fitting the character, but what happens if I'm on a trail and you've got disc golf next door? And so those are the sorts of things we have to kind of think about as we design um, design those facilities. Um, uh, and then. Uh, uh, the site-specific feedback. Uh, pickleball courts were really heavily supported. Most people really did focus to four courts versus two, so they could have more community events and more social and more league-type play. They just don't have a lot of that anywhere else. Um, love those photos of hillside play. Off-leash we talked about. Um, and you can see the, the other elements that were really um, that were really talked about. I think the, the parking, um, particularly for Beaton Hill, we heard a lot about. Um, a lot about concerns with people crossing, which we understand, and a lot of methods and tools to try to make that as safe as possible. Um, but also a lot of, of support both for on within parking within the site itself, but also maintaining that on-street parking so that you're not taking over, you know, you're minimizing how much of the park itself you need to use for parking. So we heard a lot of concerns both ways about that. And then for uh, Big Rock, it was really play heavily supported. Um, and, and we showed it mostly in Big Rock, but I think it's supported regardless of, of where play uh, ends up being proposed. Um, a lot of discussion about the buildings. Uh, not a lot of concern with removing the old garage. I think there's a lot of value in people who did come to the on-site um, kind of understand what you can gain by, by removing it. Um, and then the, the residence was a little more hit and miss. Um, I think everyone generally supports the barn, the pool house, the old garage, it, it makes a lot of sense. The residence was a little bit more back and forth, and we have that as one of the discussion topics today. So the online survey, very much that all of these concepts really do feel like they support and represent what we heard from the first open house, so that's always great to see as, as designers. Um, and then uh, still, again, how well the program um, and opportunities uh, represent those hopes and dreams uh, for each of the sites as well as for the building reuse. So still very much uh, in support of really a lot of the concepts that we're showing. So we did the same thing here. This is the online survey where people who chose to wrote and write in the other categories, uh, what they told us, um, and how it ranks out and what was supported or opposed. So as you go through this, we really bolded the ones that we are looking for some input and some interest and in, in that felt like it needed a bit more discussion. And that's the dog park. Um, again, mostly four, but those opposed are very strongly opposed. And so there's a lot of emotion uh, around those dog park comments. Um, disc golf, surprisingly, is still relatively even, uh, similar to what we heard at the open house. Um, whimsical elements kind of surprised me. And what we heard on that one was they, they really were drawn to the photos. They love the photos. They love that idea of, of like discovering things in the forest that kind of make you smile. The concern, I think, was with how it's going to be maintained. How is it replaced? It is still a public park. And so how does that stand up over time? Um, and so I think those were really where the concerns fell um, in those uh, and why I think it is, is more evenly matched. Um, Pea Patch really heavily supported not a lot about where it really wanted to fall between the North or the South parks. Uh, and then you can see how the rest of those fell um, being predominantly supported elements. So for our discussion, 
Um, we would like to have your input on the programming and the concept alternatives from this meeting and after all of this discussion, our job is to go away and try and create a single preferred concept for each of these two parks. So we're at three concepts now and we're really trying to narrow it down to one. So we're using both what we heard uh, up to this date at all of our outreach events as well as really trying to get some key decisions and direction um, or at least some of your comments and thoughts to help us support that decision. So you see on, to get my left and my right straight, my left hand side, uh, the generally supported are things that uh, really everybody I think galvanized around with these parks. The direction and the discussion we want to focus on tonight is on the pea patch location. Um, uh, it, does it feel like it really wants to be at the Beaten Hill or Big Rock South? Some validation and confirmation on disc golf if this is an activity that makes sense that we do want to integrate. Understanding there's always concerns with conflicts with trails and that's part of designing those disc golf systems. Um, whimsical elements, uh, it's kind of it's something that we seemed like everyone loved, but then there was also a lot of concern. So if that's something that we want to integrate, it does tend to lead a little bit more towards public art. And so in partnership with public art or something that would kind of give it structure um, is one of the thoughts that we had around that. Um, dog park versus open lawn. Again, uh, the wetland boardwalk is one I didn't mention we were going through this, but there is a lot of, of desire in the community and I think rightly so to protect our wetlands. Right? And the more you bring people into those wetlands, the more you have the potential to disturb them. So one of our concepts shows a wetland boardwalk going right through the middle of that wetland um, and connecting on Beaten Hill. The reason we did that is because while it is technically a wetland, it is essentially visually a pasture. So in the act of turning this into something that actually has value for the habitat and the ecology, you could then be, that becomes, the desire to make it better becomes the mitigation for a boardwalk. So this is one of the few locations where you're not bringing a boardwalk into an existing beautiful system, you'd be bringing a boardwalk into a degraded system and enhancing that system around it. Having said that, it is still a wetland and it still has the potential to bring people into what is a restored wetland. So. Some of your philosophies and thoughts on that would be ID. If you have any parking preferences, we'd love to hear them. Um, and then the reuse of that residence. So with that, we're gonna pause while we bring the boards up front. I'm gonna kind of go up to the front to help facilitate this discussion. And Shelby's gonna pull up the OneNote to help document the commentation and, um, and the comments that we hear. Uh, and then so hang tight while we kind of make this transition. And the fun part is also testing all of my technology as I yanked it off me as I was coming up here. So bear with me here. I have a quick question while you guys are figuring that out. Um, if I have any comments, uh, whom should I send the chat message to? Anjali, would that be you or is that somebody else that I can send? Uh, hi, Council Member Indipore. Uh This is Scott. You can send them to me, and I will be happy to share them out as you would like. Wonderful. Great. Thank you. Okay. Let me do a tech check and just make sure you guys can all hear me okay? Okay. And then from the sound online, I'll make sure someone will tell me if not. Okay, so um, the thought here is to go around and start the discussion with Beaten Hill Park with what we like most and what we like least. Uh, we're not trying to go around multiple times or we'd be here all night. So if we just wanna go around the table and talk about uh, your, what you liked about all of the concepts in general. So if you have questions, we can answer them. Um, and I know we gave you your packets, but we did go kind of fast. Yes, Mayor.
Um, the, I can go either way, Madam Mayor, if you would like to facilitate and let the hands be raised, or I can kind of go around Robin and have each person give some comments oh, and thoughts. Oh, yeah, yeah. We'll start with around the robin, and then and then let's do the do the hands or the raising afterwards. If there's some additional comments or questions, all right. So I am gonna start <laughs> this way, just to start it off. So Beaten Hill is what we're talking about first. Of all the concepts and thoughts that you saw and presented and heard, what do you like or dislike? Um, if I could ask a question first, um, yes. two things. One, were you surprised by the number of people that were interested in the amphitheater? I was actually, um, and the, the, I think what surprised me is that it was almost universally interested. There were a couple of comments about people concerned about what size of a, an event and is it amplified and what about the neighbors who live nearby and is there enough parking? That's, those are the ones that we also typically hear in almost anywhere. Um, but when they showed the photos and they looked at the size and the scale, they're like, oh, this could actually be just kind of nice to hang out in if there's nothing going on. And so I think that waylaid a lot of those fears. And that really up the interest in the amphitheater, I would think, too, like the pictures of the whimsical play. Yeah, it, it did make the, the interest, I think, a little bit more. And I think a lot of people were responding to the fact that there just isn't really anything like that in the city. Um, there are other locations, too. I mean, Beaton Hill starts to get kind of tight if you try to put everything on it. So I think it, it brought out that there's an interest in an amphitheater in the city, and this project brought that to the forefront. Okay, well, for my comment on the parks, for the most part, I just have one other quick question to address, but really my comments are, I think that the community has spoken. I think that all the things that they're interested in, you've already got an idea of how you could integrate those into the park. Um, the big question being, of course, do we devote a, a what's considered a large piece of land to the dog park, but technically for the dogs running around, is it really big enough to accommodate them really being in an open area off leash uh, to really enjoy that space that way for the other things that come with it, like the poop and the um, disease and transmission and that type of thing that's possible. Um, but my other question is disc golf. Do we have to have disc golf? Because it is very controversial. And you said it's in all of the plans to have that consistency through the park. Is that a given that it's a done deal? It is not a given and it's certainly not a done deal. Um, okay. When we heard the original hopes and dreams, it came up a lot as a very strong interest. Um, and when we talked to people about the idea of it at a lot of those events, um, it's one of the few uses that can give a purpose and, and kind of have an activity and people can kind of get and stay he healthy and get out while still being a very, very light footprint on a natural environment. Not a no footprint, but a light footprint. Um, so that is why we showed it in all three concepts. I think as a result of seeing it in all three concepts, uh, we also heard some of the, the concerns. Right, so that's my last question to this and I'll move on, but how is it you're going to mitigate that um, negative interaction between the disc golf and the um, passive um, trail walker? Yeah, so when we were designing a disc golf course, uh, there is basically a series of baskets uh, and tees, mm -hmm. right? And then there's what's called the fairway in between. So what you need to do when you design a course to avoid any conflict is that course is accessed off your trail system. The T, or sorry, the T's are fairly close to that trail system. So you step off the trail to your T, but you have to be able to throw your disc away from the trail because uh, rarely does someone mess up and throw behind them, right? So you need a certain amount of fairway and you need a certain amount of offset from the trail at all times in order to be able to have some vegetation and some trees and some other things to protect that. I will not say that there's absolutely zero, right? Which is why we have scoped out about 12 holes that seem like they kind of fit, but you would only do nine so that you're not overwhelming a site or trying to get it too densely populated in there. And it would just have to be played out over time. Okay. They do also have to stay out of wetlands and their associated buffers, which is another mitigating fact of why it's a smaller course um, and does fit, but it does, you know, you've got to really kind of hem it in there. Thank you. Uh, so Beaton Hill Park is, uh, I think we should do pr uh, preservation, conservation of it as a uh, wildlife area with uh, educational opportunities uh, to show how you can take uh, a disturbed natural area and restore it back to its uh, natural environment or a more functioning environment uh, to support wildlife. And so I'm leaning definitely more toward the gradient of activities. Uh, and I see it as part of the wildlife corridors that 
used to exist in the city and need to be returned to the <coughs> comprehensive plan. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, you oh, you're still off. One more time. There we there go. We go. There we go. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, I agree. I envision Beaton Hill Park just preserving a lot of the natural landscape there. Um, I, I guess my only thing I'm not a huge fan of for this park would be probably uh, the sports courts like pickleball and things. I just envision it being more natural. Um, I'm not opposed to dog park, but um, yeah, that's my opinion. Okay, thank you. Well, I, as I was looking at this, I was attracted to uh, whimsy and discovery as the kind of driving force. I felt it kept a lot of, char of the character, a remarkable amount of the character of the natural um, feeling and it, uh, just the ambiance, I think, to a certain extent, the ethos that's projected from that land. It, I mean, the land projects it. Mm -hmm. So I, I took this as the land telling you what to do, which is why the amphitheater made sense to me. Gotcha. Um, it just fits elegantly in there, and it's a wonderful pocket, and it's a great exploratory space, and it isn't damaging. It can be very, like the, even the image that was used with the grass growing up and so forth, I thought was strong. The other thing I thought of was um, there's a park on Mercer Island that is probably 50 years old, It's um, and it has a dragon in the middle of the park, and it was a huge sensation at the time, and kids love that thing. They're drawn so, to it, I've been there. It's, it's, you know, it's a concrete dragon. So it, and kids adore it, and it's it's stayed for this entire period. So that's the whimsy, mm -hmm. and that's how to integrate it. It's not, sure, it's, I guess you could say it's art, but that wasn't its function. Its function was to be just a, uh, a catalyst for kids to just go crazy and it was wonderful. The other image that comes to mind is even a, um, maybe a scaled down version of what Bellevue has done with their park. With, if you're- The Universal Play at the Downtown Park? Yeah. Because <laughs> it is phenomenal. Yeah. And it is a magnet. And the only thing <laughs> sadder to me than, than nobody in a park. Well, there's very few things sadder to me than nobody in the park. It's, and then the saddest thing is no children in the park. So there has to be an attractive magnet to help pull those kids in. Because if you want them to play in the environment, you, yeah, like start, kick, but give them something to start with, and then they'll explore and run into the trails. So I lean in hard there. I also really like the fact that the parking is contained. Um, the public comment had a strong impact on me <laughs> in terms of what was said, and I thought that was extremely well done. Um, All right. I'm, I'm debating about the dog park part. Um, I could let that one go because we have a really good dog park at Beaver Lake, so. Okay, thank you. I share many of Karen's thoughts. Um, there are certain aspects that I like on each of the plans. Um, I do like the off street parking. Uh, I like um, I like the idea where you have parking both at the upper up in the upper area as well as the area along southeast eighth. Um, and again, like here, and I have some concerns about the dog park. On the one hand, um, that's a large space to have for the dogs uh, restricts what else you can do with the park. On the other hand, um, I'm concerned that if you don't have a dog park, people are going to bring their p dogs anyway, and they're going to run into the wetlands, and there'll be some degradation because of that. So I'm, I'm th um, thinking, I'm, you know, I'm not sure which way to go on that. Um, but the, I, I've, I've been to the Mercer Island Park, of which you spoke, was a favorite with my kids when they were young, and I like those ideas as well. Uh, thanks. I'll dive into the, the dog park. Um, we do have great dog parks over at Beaver Lake, but it's not enough. We have a lot of dogs. Um, and while I do think it will take up space, we are blessed, um, again, mostly due to uh, the Beaton family and to uh, Mary Pickett with a lot of space. And I think having a dog park where dogs can go and run off leash is great. Um, as a matter of fact, I think having more dog parks so you can segregate them more by size is even more important. So um, just the two sizes at Beaver Lake can be challenging because 
you can have a dog in the middle that doesn't really fit either place, right? And some of those big dogs are really big. You need like the ginormous dog section and then one for everyone else. So um, I'm, a big, I'm a big fan of the dog park and I agree that um, if we don't have one, people will let their dogs run and then there's gonna be other issues because with the dog. So I think that's a big one. Um, disc golf, I, I'm kind of shocked by this. Like I, I, I don't think I've ever actually seen someone play disc golf. I've been to parks where there are disc golf golf courses and I've never actually seen anyone play. So I could probably sacrifice the disc golf for some of the other comments that I saw around like outdoor um, sort of fitness things that can still encourage people to get out into nature, but maybe don't require as much um, maintenance and maybe won't have people throwing things. Um, Whimsical fitness. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm kind of, exactly. I'm kind of in between the, the play space for everyone and, and whimsy and discovery. I think there are elements of both that are really attractive. From a parking perspective, I would say pick the one that offers our ability to create the most parking spaces. Um, I think we can address the concerns raised by the public comment. Um, through design and through, you know, signage and lights and things like that, but definitely whatever we can do to have the most space. I, I'm a little bit attracted to the one that's on the street because it can be used for both parks more readily. I think if you have the one that's kind of up in the middle of Beaton Hill, people aren't gonna be as inclined to, to go to both. On that note, one of the things that I think we need to address is instead of focusing on parking, how do we connect these parks to other modes of transportation so that I don't have to get in a car and drive to the park, I can walk to the park or I can ride my bike to the park. So I think that's, um, again, probably outside the scope of parks in general, but I think that's a big important issue, right? Especially Beaton Hill um, and the Big Rock parks that are there. Um, there is not a safe passage on foot to get there. Um, every road that leads to there requires people to take their lives into their own hands. And I think that's um, not a great idea. Uh, in terms of gardens, I didn't, I saw in the word cloud, botanical garden was huge twice. Um, but I didn't hear you talking specifically about botanical gardens in any of these designs. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, certainly. So um, botanical garden, I think, has a couple of different connotations, right? So if you think about like the Bellevue Botanical Garden or some of the botanical gardens in Portland or even, you know, the um, Volunteer Park, right, with its conservator conservatory. And I think when people think about botanical gardens, sometimes that's the, the view that they have. Um, the, the site and the ability to just have anybody and everybody really just experience these gardens and have education and you can have like, you know, a little sign about pollinator species and species lists and things like that. But, but something that you kind of have to build a new structure and, and you kind of go into and you sort of enclose off and, and has a, a kind of a different connotation to it didn't feel like the right fit when we really talked through what that meant. Um, and so you'll see gardens very strongly played out in Big Rock South because it is already a beautiful garden experience. Mm -hmm. We just don't use the word botanical in front of it so that people don't feel like it's something I'm gonna have to pay to go see. Got it. Right, so gardens, just not formal botanical gardens, not formal greenhouses that would kind of convey or support or create a lot of uh, higher level of maintenance at these sites. And I know we have a, um, a Sammamish Botanical Garden group, so um, you know, working with them, because I would agree it doesn't have to be a formal structure to still be a botanical garden, so hopefully we could accommodate that. Um, and I will say that the yep. city has taken that idea of an interest in botanical gardens, and I think, Shelby, if I'm correct, is kind of looking more citywide. Is there a spot or an opportunity to kind of do that at a, at a different location? Excellent. And then um, in terms of the kids playground, I agree. Um, I think having kids playgrounds with covered areas so that people can take their kids, even when it's misting rain and they can have a place to sit where it's dry while the kids are out not caring if they get wet. Um, we did have a group of kids come last year uh, and do a presentation on um, playgrounds that can be designed for kids of all abilities. Um, and I would uh, urge us strongly that as we develop some of these play structures that we make sure we have play structures that are accommodating to our, all of our kids, um, no matter what their physical abilities are. Some of them were very cool, right? Where you can have your chairs, you can do swings, you can do all sorts of things no matter what. And I, I think that that's gotta be a top priority for us. Thank you. I'll be real specific here. Um, I don't like the boardwalk and the wetland. 
Okay. So I'd like to see that removed. There's no reason to go to that expense, I don't think. And, um, and we can just leave it as open space. If we let it go wild, I don't think we'll see a lot of traffic in there anyway. Okay. Um, I'd like to see the I'd like to see off-street par parking too, but I'd like to see it consolidated instead of distributed. So we have two different spots for parking, but I think uh, if we can consolidate into one spot instead of putting cars in different places of the park, I think that would be a positive element. Um, I like this hillside play idea of creating a big slide down the hill. So I like elements. I'm like Hank. I like elements of all of these. Great. I believe that the best place, but we know we have a huge service deficit in pea patches. We need to build more pea patches. There's a tr tremendous waiting list, three-year waiting list for people to get a pea patch. The best place from a sun perspective and climate perspective is Beaton Hill Park. Okay. Um, you know, it fits within the theme, I think, of Big Rock, but there is a lot more shading there. So. Boy, that's a puzzle. I'm not sure how to, how to work it out. And I hate to just, you know, it seems like you have to trade uh, um, dog park for pea patch. And those are both two very popular elements and how to get those both into these. I'm not sure. So. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right. Um, yeah, so I like a combination um, whimsy space for everyone. <laughs> That's what I'm going to call it. Uh, name it to your heart's content. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, so first question, can pickleball be used for anything else, those courts? Yeah, so um, two, you, you can get some multi-use. Two, two pickleball courts fits on one tennis court. Cool. Having said that, if you make, you, you generally need to pick one as, a, as the main, mm -hmm. and you can always transition over time or have some shifting if needed, but one ends up being a temporary net, one ends up being a somewhat more permanent net. Cool. Um, so yeah, I think I actually got an email asking about pickleball. So I guess my things are, um, thankfully I walked down to 18th today with my dogs and obviously that is the worst, scariest street ever. Um, so my concerns are left-hand turns into those parking lots okay. um, coming down the hill because there is like no sight with that steep hill on top. So I like the parking of concept three at the bottom but combined with potentially, because I don't see ADA stalls specific here in concept three, but concept two's drop off with four ADA specific stalls, I do like that on top combined with the concept three parking at the bottom. Okay. Um, and I am a fan of the dog park only because my dogs, only one of my dogs likes the dog park, but uh, the issue is now everyone just runs their dogs everywhere. That's usually what I run into on Big Rock, so then my dogs are approached and they're like, ugh. So I would love a designated area because I know that's just a, it's a spot. So I'm preferring the dog park. So I'm just gonna want everything. Yep. <laughs> uh, I do want a dog park, but then I, I would rather have the two pickleball courts with an amphitheater instead of the dog park and four pickle, pickleball courts. Got it. Thank you. I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah. Uh, I like the amphitheater. I think that's, uh, like you said, that's a, a very cool amenity that we don't have elsewhere in the city, um, and especially based on the support that it received from the community. Um, generally, I like concept two the most. Um, I would like to see if we could move the pea patch that's uh, from concept one onto the, roughly the same footprint, the open lawn on concept two. Um, as Nancy mentioned, we do have a demonstrated need for more pea patches in the community. I know uh, the plan for Klahani Park to have one was mentioned as well, but as far as I understand, even if the even if this was built out and Klahani Park was built out, we would still not meet the need, the demonstrated need that is now. I think our wait list is over 150 people, yeah. and yeah, that wouldn't be met. So, um, seeing the the concept one pea patch on concept two, um, I think uh, that would be cool to see. Pickleball. I'm going to put that into uh, gradient, so gradient one, gradient pea patch on the whimsy plan, just because everyone's using the terms. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> For those who might not, can't see it at the same time. Uh, pickleball, I think, um, on, con on concept two on whimsy, it looks like there might be space to maybe footprint four pickleball courts Could, there if, yes. if the league play is, you know, if people really want that, um, so that might be something to consider, but then that's really crowding the space. I don't know if that's if that's too much. Um, and then echoing uh, Councilmember Stewart, 
if we decide not to go with disc golf, some outdoor exercise machines, I think, could be uh, an interesting amenity. We don't really have that in the city. We have some of them around Yellow Lake and Glahani, and um, I, I've seen them get used. I think it's it's nice to have, so that might be something to uh, look into. Great, thank you. Hi, um, I kind of, looking through all your data, and it seemed like all three concepts Pretty much there were almost a third each. Everybody really liked, a third of everybody liked all the concepts. There was very little in between. So there was like 0.2, 0 0.3% mm -hmm. between. Uh, but everybody seemed to love everything, which is which is great. It seems like we're on the right track. Um, personally, I kind of came down on the side of whimsy and discovery. That's kind of just appealed to my personal um, um, preference. But however, I know we're not um, building a park for me. So um, I don't understand disc golf. And again, I echo what's been said. I've seen disc golf amenities in parks. I've never seen them used. So I'm not really sure where this disc golf thing is coming from. I also think it's kind of fraught with going wrong. I can see people walking in these open spaces with their kids or just walking together. Next thing, a thing comes flying across their vision and it kind of spoils the whole notion of being out in getting some respite in nature. And so I'm not sure this really fits in here at all. I think that's maybe something for a more athletic environment. Um, I am in favor of a dog park. I'm not a dog owner myself, but I do feel if we don't have a designated place for dogs, the dogs will be just kind of off leash all over the place. And so I think we need to help give more amenities to that so we have a designated dog park space. Um, the one thing that I did think about when I was looking at the parks in general is that we have this amazing opportunity of being given all this wonderful land, and thank you, Mary and the Beaton family. Um, but what is it in our park system, and we have a fabulous one in this city, but what is it that we're not supplying? What is it that we we don't have? Or the, what, me, what need are we not meeting? And it seems pea patch seems to be like a colossal one. I hear a lot from, from residents as well about pickleball. That seems to be the latest and greatest sport. Um, and maybe I'll play it someday. Who knows if I take, take a whim. Um, so I think those kinds of needs need to be thought about. Um, I love the amphitheater notion. That is something we do not have. Um, and um, one more thing, I think, was just more opportunity for gathering spaces. And I think that's really what our community are looking for. More places to get together, to meet, to have their clubs meet together um, and families come together. So I'm coming down on the whimsy and discovery, but um, I think all of them are super. So thank you. Great, thank you. So I just kind of picked and choose from the three different concepts. Um, so I'll just go um, down the list of the things I've highlighted that I've liked or didn't like. I am in support of the dog park. I don't think that we have enough dog parks. Um, to council member um, Pam's, Pam Stewart's comment that we need more than one. Um, contrary to a lot of people, I do not support the amphitheater here. I think it's easy to think short term. You know, we have the space, so let's put one in now. I do think longer term that the amphitheater would be a better fit closer to the town center in the event that we want to make it larger and it has transit, so it's more convenient and, you know, people can come and there will, will be less parking issues. Um, I support the both Universal and Hillside play. I think the, the giant slide or whatever it is um, would be a really fun amenity. I just think that if we put something there, which potentially may not be accessible for everybody, that we are mindful that Universal play is used on in Big Rock Park South. Um, I don't think we have enough pea patches, so I definitely support more pea patches. And I support four pickleball courts because I don't think there, I, there are lots of tennis courts here and we tend to, and we have prioritized tennis. And so it would be nice to have pickleball people, pickleball courts for people that want to play pickleball exclusively and not have to show up and have people playing tennis. And that would also give them opportunities to have competitions and just have larger um, gatherings. And other cities, neighboring cities, have prioritized um, that amenity. Um, I'm not a fan of disc golf. I've played disc golf. And 
my my discs went everywhere and it'd be like beware if anybody was out walking and I was playing so I definitely do not support disc golf um, for the whimsical elements I think that's a really cool um, thing to have in a park I, I like the idea that each park has its own unique character and we don't have a park that has these whimsical elements um, I do know that in the near future that the Arts Commission um, will be working on some sort of strategic plan and it would be great to have public art as the whimsical elements I think there would be less maintenance and upkeep if that's the case and that would make sort of a more unique um, make the this these parks more unique um, and in terms of preferred parking locations um, hearing the public comment I do prefer moving the the parking so that it is off street okay thank you I'm uh, I have a couple questions first because um, I haven't heard I haven't heard this this being told to us what is the capacity that we've been talking about on this amphitheater so the amphitheater itself and the size that we've shown at absolute max capacity could not take more than about like 70 80 people if you were like to truly max it out I think the typical kind of presentation when we looked at how many people would fit in it it's really more like 30 to 50 we're not talking large sizes um, it would so we're talking you know smaller theater type groups kids little small kids presentations you know you're not doing concerts because there's just not a lot of space you might have a saxophone guy or a guy's guitar kind of hanging out um, but we're definitely talking smaller scale okay well I, I don't support the amphitheater I, I agree with with councilmember lamb I think it's it's either gonna be too big for the parking that we're gonna I mean if we have 70 people plus other users of the park that's a lot of cars yeah your that probably average would probably really be more like the 40 to if 50, we fill up yes. the if we fill up the parking spaces they're going to park on the street they're going to park in the residential we're going to have the current problems that we've already heard about we're going to have some amish landing problems up there it 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 just doesn't seem safe or smart i, th I think it's a, a better idea to have it somewhere in the future up in the town center area where we could have something bigger and and not worry about the, the parking so I, I don't support the amphitheater at all I do support the dog park um, I also don't support the the um, disc golf I, I agree with some of the statements I'm not sure where I'm, I'm really not sure where it came came from how it got into the and I said I said that when it came to the, the Parks Commission I, I don't know where it suddenly came came from it's a great idea if we could put it on Beaton Hill but not at at Big Rock South. Uh, let me, if, if you don't mind, I apologize for the interruption. I do nope. think there's um, a little bit of context with the disc golf just because it's come up from a couple of people that might be helpful for the conversation. Shelby? Yeah, let me bring my handy dandy microphone. <laughs> so the disc golf, um, like pickleball, um, disc golf and pickleball are the two largest sports in the nation right now and has grown significantly since the beginning of COVID. And throughout COVID, we have had a number of requests from citizens for disc golf courses in the city. And in looking at different opportunities for incorporating more passive recreation into Big Rock South, we thought this could be a great opportunity to have an overlap between trail use and disc golf. And we don't have any other locations in our city that could accommodate a nine hole disc golf course thank you um, so that's where it came from uh, there is a lot of concern about trail users conflicting with disc golf discs when you design them well there really is very little to no conflict but you do have to design them as such which is good to do when you're starting it's a lot harder to put them in later yes so so that would be why I, I, I don't like the disc golf part I do like the pea patches I think we need need more pea patches as has already been said um, I do like the the open lawn or the dog parks um, I do have a concern with the um, on beaten on Big Rock Park South with the um, keeping of the of the residents of the re residents. of the residents okay. I was gonna say I was trying to be more general of the buildings the buildings okay. of the buildings um, especially the residents um, I've heard 
I've heard that the basement floods. I've heard that there's some issues. So my concern is more how much is it going to cost us to bring it up to a standard where it can be used because using it as a as a residence is, is very different than using it as a public, yes. government-funded, government-insured piece of property. So I, I would be very, very concerned about the cost. I mean, if we can, and, and yes, I, I hate, I've, I've seen the building. The, it's, it's a beautiful residence. I would hate to, I hate to bulldoze it. But if we need more space, but it's going to cost us a whole lot of money every year to maintain it, every year to, just to bring it up to ADA standards that we would have, that we would need to have it at to use it, I, I, the, the finance person in me can't justify can't really justify that very very well. So that that's my concern with with a lot of the, the buildings that are on Big Rock Park South. They're they're great, they're beautiful, but can we use them? If we can't use them, then let's use the let's use it for something else. Those are, those are my comments. Thank you. Uh, hi, Councilmember Inapore. This is your opportunity. You're up uh, you're right. up on the list. So <laughs> please go ahead and jump in. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think uh, there's an advantage to going last because many of the things that I wanted to say have been said. So I'll again sort of uh, start with thanking the Beaton family and Mary Piggott. Um, I wish I could be there in person to thank them, uh, but what a generous gift to our city. So thank you again. Um, my preference uh, for the parks is to keep it as, as natural as it can be. So. Um, along with a touch of whimsy, if possible. Um, I, I think for me, it's uh, parks are really where communities come together. And, uh, you know, that's where we build our community too. So I am re definitely um, in favor of activities uh, that bring people together. And I think the pea patch is, is one of those ideas. Um, I, I would love to see maybe some different designs and how these pea patches are done, where there can be more interaction between the communities. I think typically when I've gone past them, they're kind of off to the side, fenced in, and um, but I'd like to see more community interaction there. Um, uh, I had a question about the dog park. Um, I know dog parks can also be a great way where we meet our neighbors or, you know, people from different parts of the city. Um, I think initially you mentioned, you know, it would be half the size of a Beaver Lake dog park. Uh, Beaver Lake has two, you know, small and a uh, sort of medium slash big dog park. And I just wasn't sure how big one this would be. Um, and then um, again, with with the disc golf course, I'm not very familiar, but I, I kind of share the same same concerns. Um, but also recognize that that could be something that kind of creates a unique space in our city, um, which maybe others can use. Um, I, I had had a question on the wetland, um, the boardwalk. Um, do we have any other boardwalks in the city? I think one park has it in our city. Uh, right now, from what my understanding is, and again, I want to thank the park staff here for giving me a tour before I went to India, um, is that it's it's not um, sort of like an active... Uh, it, it would have to be restored. The, the area where we think there's a wetland, it would need to be restored. So what's the advantage to having like that uh, boardwalk? Um, Parking concerns, absolutely. How can we make these parking uh, make these parks walkable? Um, you know, another sort of great use of parks that I've seen is by our schools, by our local schools, where they do little field trips, or you know, it's just uh, even maybe our private schools use that as play areas. Um, and I, I'd like to really understand that a little bit more. Um, uh, for example, if, if Creekside Elementary decides that they want um, uh, to walk to, you know, Big Rock Park South, uh, can they do that safely? What are the other ways in which we can get there? Um, and then also, you know, are we encouraging other um, schools or, or facilities to, to sort of use um, our parks? Um, Coming back to the parking, I'm also curious if we've talked to um, other maybe organizations that are close to these parks for share, sharing uh, parking um, um, spaces with them or have some agreement with that. So I don't know if that's part of today's discussion, but I'd just like to 
um, sort of talk about that. Um, and um, I think it was mentioned briefly, that, but I strongly support creating our parks for uh, all abilities. Uh, right now, we're very focused on very able and active uh, people, but I've seen, you know, older generations or, you know, um, senior citizens use this park, people again with different abilities. So I would really like us to be this unique space which caters uh, specifically for um, sort of multi-sensory um, space. Um, and I, I support arts in the park, so really looking forward to seeing how that uh, plays out. So thank you. Great, thank you. There were a couple of questions in there um, that I can recall, and Shelby can help me if I miss maybe a few. Um, there has been some discussion about parking, particularly at Big Rock South. There's a temple across the street. So there has been some mention in the past about particularly if there's events at the barn or you know if, there's, if there is more events in those and the use of those buildings that additional parking would be needed. We also have started looking at some overflow capabilities of that site as well. That was one question that you had. Um, the adjacency of the schools we haven't talked about, but that is a fairly typical if there's a park within walking distance. And I think we've heard a couple of times tonight to look a little broader to the connectivity of the park. So that's been some really good feedback um, that we'll take to heart as we develop a preferred plan. I'm missing a few, I think, Shelby. The oh, the boardwalk was one. Um, the boardwalk uh, is, I think as someone mentioned, they are typically more expensive. Are there other boardwalks in a similar kind of restored wetland setting for the educational value in the city? I can't speak to the specifically restored areas, but Evans Creek Preserve has a really large network of boardwalk trails. There's over 20 boardwalks within the trail system, and that was done by volunteers, um, WTA, and um, city-led volunteer work parties. I don't believe Mark Perry has spoken yet. Yep, yeah. There's one more, right. I am, I am here, so I guess it's an advantage of me going last. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, and sorry I couldn't be there. Um, we're celebrating my mother-in-law's 90th birthday in Yosemite, California. But I, I too wanna to thank the parks team and the community for all the feedback that we got. Um, it's been fantastic. Um, so I'll, I'll be very specific. I kind of like the option one and two, the preservation and the whimsy. Um, the pea patch would be high on my list because I know we're seeing that from a request across the community. And I think the more we can support that, the better. Um, you know, improving parking as much as we can. I'm not gonna say I'm qualified to say consolidated versus distributed or whatever, but I do think there'd be an opportunity to get um, to minimize the risk by getting it off the street. I know for one with two dogs, unless I'm 100% on my game, I, I have, there is an opportunity for one dog to jump out when I'm not holding um, them both getting out of the car. So they may run across the street and I'd worry about that for their safety and for others. And I'm sure there's other dog owners and maybe even parents or grandparents that feel about the same with their kids. Um, so I do worry about parking some. Um, I do think the dog park would be fantastic um, as an additional um, facility for our residents because it seems like the population of dogs is growing, which is fantastic. And giving them a space to run around, play, meet other furry friends is, would be great. Um, gathering spaces, I think, is, is extremely important uh, for our community. I think a lot of these amenities that we've talked about with those two options would facilitate that along with pickleball. So I'd be very much in support of pickleball. Um, I know that's a, a growing interest as far as a sport. Um, what I like least, I am a disc golf player and I've actually been playing for a long time. Um, and I'm not saying I, I would be a pro at it, but I'm pretty good. My worry is it looks like it's just fit in or crammed in and a smaller nine hole disc golf course will probably attract people that are new to the game. Um, and I worry about uh, disc flying everywhere um, as was brought up before. So I wouldn't be for disc golf. So I, I think there's opportunities to look at that elsewhere and there's disc golf courses outside of our city and others that are very good. And I also wouldn't support the amphitheater. I just don't think that's the right amenity at Eaton Park. Great. That's it. Thank you.
I think that is everybody that's gone around the table now. Um, Just one quick clarification, if I could. When you talked about the um, uh, Big Rock South as having the parking across the street, potentially, is are you guys going to be responsible for creating that crossing path across the street to take, or is that something that then comes after the crossing? Any, so if there is any partnership that could occur with another organization like the temple across the street, um, part of that discussion uh, would generally be used only during events, right? It wouldn't be like an everyday thing, um, but when you're doing an event or an off hours type of a situation, uh, whether you facilitate crossings and how you facilitate those crossings, if they're temporary during events and they're signers, et cetera, or permanent if it's a long-term solution, is all part of that discussion of how something might happen. So there's no real kind of right or wrong answer. If you're gonna promote people crossing a street, they need to have a safe crossing. So it just depends on how and where and, and how that all would play out over time. But that may not necessarily be part of this. That would be an after No, it would be, yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be part of this particular Perfect. process. Okay. I think we're, we're looking at what fits on a regular everyday situation and that parking would not be like a regularly relied upon option. Okay, great, thank you. Um, are there other questions? Yes. Not questions, I just wanted to follow up. Uh, Council Member Anna Plore had a couple more things that she remembered after the fact. One is that she wants to, she supports keeping the, re the residences for use of activities and events at Big Rock South. And she would love an amphitheater near Commons, not just in the new park. So just. Thank you. Anything else, Council Member? Um, you covered it. I, I think I just for clarification purpose, um, Judy, when you mentioned temple, uh, I think it's the mosque. I just want to be clear because the, the temple, which is considered the Hindu temple, is on, on 228, and the one that we have here is the mosque. So thank you just very so much for that clarification. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. It's about the amphitheater. I think the way that I was thinking of the amphitheater is not unlike the way that the uh, sculpture park is set up at the, where it's it's a passive space. It's not really, it is a gathering space, but people bring their lunch and eat their lunch there. They hang out. It's a. I think um, it becomes, it's, some of it is, there's, there's a lot of power in the words we use, right? Um, an amphitheater uh, connotates that someone at some point is gonna schedule an event and use it for something that invites people to come and gather for this time frame, right? Um, a gathering place can look an awful lot like what, you, what you're thinking of, and it's just you know built into the hillside, and it's got some seats, and it's a place that people can just come and congregate and hang out while their kids are playing on that slide that's over there. Um, I'm hearing, at least in general, we like the idea of an amphitheater, maybe an actual organized event with larger numbers of people is not the best place at Beaton Hill. Lots of people are nodding their heads. Um, but I don't think it precludes the idea of using that hillside to create a lot of what I've heard tonight is we need more gathering spaces and even the concepts we show, I didn't talk a lot about what's been integrated in them, but I still think based on what I'm hearing, we could do that a little bit more directly and make it a little bit more prominent in these concepts. Lots of head nodding, so unless someone online or, or would be opposed to that kind of uh, interpretation of what I've heard tonight. Okay. Yeah, um, one thing that I forgot to bring up, um, and I, I think we've mixed some of our comments across the parks, but um, one is, uh, as we look at hillside play, I will tell you, we need to keep some hillsides open so when it does snow, there's a place for kids to go sledding, because wherever there's a hill, people will go sledding. So while I like the idea of hillside play, let's keep some of those hills open, man. We gotta, we gotta have toboggan races or whatever. The other thing, and this might be more appropriate to Big Rock Park South, so I might be jumping ahead here, but um, two of our high schools, uh, well, all of our high schools have cross country teams. The two high schools, uh, East Lake and Skyline, um, they have kind of sad cross country courses. So the Skyline cross country course is actually not even an official meet because it's not actually long enough. Um, and the East Lake one is usually held at Beaver Lake and much of it is run on pavement, which if you know anything about cross country runners, they usually have cleats on, so it's not the best experience. So as we're designing these parks, I'm hoping we can think about can we make sure that there uh, are enough trails that one could design cross-country courses for our high schoolers to have a, a place to run? Um, 
And then I do agree with the amphitheater. I love the idea. Uh, I do think it should be bigger and in the town center area because we should be scheduling and having performances, um, but we should only do that um, in a place that's appropriately spaced and has transit and maybe parking. So thanks. Thank you. So since we're on the topic of amphitheaters and you mentioned that it could be like integrated in Hillside and it's not less, so it's less like the images that you have here. So perhaps you could provide us images in the next round of the idea that you're talking about. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm hearing less amphitheater, more gathering space. Got it, thank you. So we'll start again. <laughs> uh, I think the idea of the uh, saying something like an amphitheater for Beaton was just based on the, the topography, right? So we're giving it that definition. But like you said, it's more of a loosely tiered opportunity for people to have places to actually sit and gather so they're not rolling down a hill pre-snow. <laughs> Are there other comments on Beaton Hill? And I do want to run through a little bit of what I think I've heard collectively as we move forward before I do that. Okay, so um, if I'm taking as a, as a collective group what I'm reading back, um, I'm hearing uh, pea patch is heavily supported. And again, this is, well, we haven't quite hit Big Rock, but I think there's a lot of overlap between the conversations. Um, I'm hearing more for whimsy and this idea of whimsy integrated into parks than I heard against. I think the maintenance is still a concern, but there are some ways we can maybe address that. Um, I am hearing uh, no for the amphitheater. We talked about that one, but more gathering spaces. I'm hearing definitely parking being off street, but not necessarily completely precluded from the street if we can do it in a safer way, but we wanna kind of get that off street parking um, to the extent that we can. Um, I'm hearing, I think, a little more for dog park than against dog park with still some concerns. So if I were to actually ask a raise of hands, I think we'd have more for than against, but there's not, it's definitely not a unanimous either. I'm seeing all raised hands. I know that we, no, I'm saying, I'm seeing lots of head nodding. I'm not trying to ask you to raise your hands because I wouldn't be able to count straight anyways with our offline, but I, I do know it's not unanimous, but a little bit more for than against. Um, okay, have I missed anything else in, let's see, on our list that would affect Big Rock or Beaten Hill on our list of questions? Oh, um, pickleball. I heard mostly yes for pickleball. I think a little bit mixed between two or four courts, but if we can squeeze four courts, I didn't hear anyone truly opposed to four courts. More about just the space of not overcrowding the park. And if you're going to do that, then provide the parking. And make sure we have parking to support the courts. Okay. Uh, yes, so um, in, uh, did universally you wanna inclusive. Did you want to talk anything everywhere. about the boardwalk? Sorry, uh, oh, I, because I know that's very specific to Beaton, uh, Beaton, right? Yes, thank you for bringing that up. I um, am not hearing a huge amount of support for the boardwalk, and I think there were some very good comments that you've got boardwalks in other parts of the city. It is a more expensive element, and if we're going to restore it, let's not bring people through the middle of it. Is that a pretty fair statement? Is, is there, so is there still, there is still not a universal statement though. There is some interest to have a boardwalk, but not Definitely as Definitely interest on a boardwalk. Okay. Um, uh, does the question of an overlook that still gives you some education or get close to the wetland satisfy some of that interest? I'm looking right at you. <laughs> and it's okay to just say no, or no, I don't know yet. Yeah, no. Okay, thank you. I, I think, you know, just in general for the boardwalk, um, maybe cost is something we have to look at. Like, where does that fall in terms of cost, and does that become one of the first items we may have to cut? I don't, it's not okay. that I don't like the idea of a boardwalk, it's just that um, as we have our very, 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 very long wish lists of things, um, I'm struggling to keep that at the top of the list. So in interest of time, I think I've heard both for and against, and I understand the cost implications. So um, I think that covered the majority of, of the questions that we wanted direction on. Shelby, am I missing anything specific on our directions list? Okay, doesn't look like it. So we do wanna hit a beat, um, get my parks, big rock south, um, and do a similar around the table. Um, if you're, a lot of those comments about universal play and trails and recreation and disc golf, of course, I think apply, so we don't necessarily need to repeat all of those. Um, 
uh, gathering spaces, et cetera. I think what the focus on um, Big Rock South, if there is anything in addition that you haven't shared with us about what you like or dislike, uh, we certainly want to hear that. Um, the residents in particular, we did hear from a couple of, of our members tonight, um, but maybe not necessarily everybody because we were still focused on Beaton. Uh, so I would like to hear about that. Um, and then I think uh, pea patch, I'm hearing mostly, we, we universally agree that we want it. I'm hearing, I think, a little bit more towards putting it in beaten from what I've heard tonight. But if there's any other kind of preferences between one or the other, um, I'd like to hear that as well. Okay, I'm gonna go in reverse order and start with the folks that were online. So you're not last this time. Um, and uh, Mr. Manager, if you could help me. <laughs> sure, uh, I think let's uh, start with, uh, it's Commissioner, is it Perry? Mm -hmm. Perry? Commissioner Perry, why don't you kick us off and then Councilmember Inapore will come after you. Okay, great. Um, th this one for me is a hard one because I'll start off with um, th some of the, the dwellings and whether we remove or, or keep. I, I worry about removing any um, and then realizing down the road that we need some sort of facility either for community events, meetings, you know, or whatever. So I do worry about removing any existing uh, dwellings um, and that's just a concern I have. Um, but I also know there's a counter to that and that's the, the cost of those and whether they're gonna be used and we, do we know they're gonna you know, be used in the most effective manner. Um, so I, I'm still struggling with that one because I do have this feeling that um, you know, it'd be tough from a community standpoint to remove something and then realize later that, that we needed it. Um, but I, I guess if I were to make a decision, I probably would decide on removing it because there, you know, it would probably be um, a, a cost advantage, which cost is not, not necessarily the most important factor, but I just don't know how we would use all those facilities, um, especially the ones that we've been talking about. So that one I, I struggle with and I still struggle with it, but I'd probably lean towards removing it um, until we could specifically define what it would be used for, which I don't believe I understand it clearly yet. Okay, um, Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say that that, that makes sense um, and it is something we can kind of come back with some more additional information on. Um, to frame the conversation with the buildings, I will say we have heard pretty consistently and loudly that there is a lack of meeting space in the city as a whole. Um, there's been less concern of the ability to use them, that there, there is lots of use uh, and that they would be used if they uh, are to remain. Um, there is a cost to renovating them. We have looked at, um, and our architects have started to look at those costs. Um, most of these buildings are not terribly difficult to renovate to allow that public use. Um, having said that, there's a cost to everything and the residence does have a little bit more of that cost, I think, than, um, than some of the other buildings. Um, uh, if that just kind of helps kind of frame that discussion a little bit more. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, I definitely think, you know, the, the barn um, could be used for um, youth activities um, and other type of events. I think that's great. Um, and probably the pool house as well. Um, it's just it's more of the main residence that I was thinking of great. and how that would be utilized. Um, I think a, a great um, feature of Big Rock South is just that ability to connect the trails with Big Rock Central and subsequent parks. I, I think that's just gonna be huge. So as long as we can preserve as much as that as possible and that um, you know, nature aspect is, is gonna be, I think, very important. All right, thank you. All right, Council Member Indipore, you're up. All right, um, so actually I, I had more of a question than, uh, than a comment at this time. You know, we've talked about potentially the pea patch, the pickleball courts, uh, maybe the dog park, even like in Beaton Hill. And, and my question there is, 
and I've seen, I can visualize that, but how much of the space is just going to be sort of reserved for these particular um, activities? And would, does that preclude, uh, you know, just general use of those spaces? And, and how much percentage are we talking about just sort of closing these areas off in, in Beaton Hill especially? And the question I think is particular to Beaton Hill where we were talking about those various activities. Correct. Yeah, so in Correct. Beaton Hill, um, all of the activities that we're basically talking about would be within the open meadow areas. Um, and even that hillside play is currently an open hillside, a meadow basically um, along the slope. So if you're looking at the site plan, um, you know, you're talking about less than half uh, of the site uh, is kind of programmed with these spaces. Um, I don't have an exact percentage, but just kind of going off of proportionately on each of these site plans. The, the, uh, the northern probably quarter to a third of the entire site is preserved with just trails and picnic areas. And the, what would be the east half is um, almost entirely preserved with wetlands and open space as well. Um, sorry, just one sec. <clears throat> so that means that uh, pretty much, like if we decide to have the pea patch and the pickleball courts and the dog park, uh, it, it really takes up, up, up all of that meadow land, right? And, and so my question there is, is there a potential to sort of move these? To, so for example, can we visualize a pea patch maybe in Big Rock Park um, South, for example. Yeah. And, you know, maybe the dog park somewhere else. So, so more of the distributed uh, activities than just in one place. Yeah, so I can, I can understand where uh, that's going in, in terms of is there enough space on Beaton Hill for these activities? And, and yes, there is with the addition of parking as well. We can fit all of those in. Um, there is a concept that shows a pea patch in Big Rock South. Um, it is uh, not as sunny as, as Beaton Hill North is, um, and it is a little smaller for the space we have available. Um, but that is, is uh, there is an option to do that. The other more active dedicated uses uh, are, are not generally as feasible in Big Rock South, so that's why they are continuing to show them in Beaton Hill. Great, thank you, that helps. You're welcome. All right, uh, so moving on to our, in our room. If we wanna go the opposite here, go for it. Well, I've, I've already said some of my concepts, some of my comments, but I prefer the whimsy and discovery for Big Rock Park South. I like, I like how the parking lot is, is designed in this one because it, it allows, it, it seems to me to be more accessible to people who may not be able to walk long distances so they could park almost all the way up by the barn in this instance and not have to walk very far. Or they could also park all the way down at the beginning and not have to walk very far. So, so to me that's kind of, that, that's, that's kind of what I like about this. Obviously, I don't like the disc golf. Um, I would say for all the residents, I, I, I I like keeping the buildings, especially turning the, the old garage into the picnic shelter. I, I like that concept. And my only issue with the, keeping the residence is how much is it going to cost us to, to do that? Because that might, it, it might just be something that we, we can't, okay. you know, we, we can't do. And I don't think there was anything else I really, yeah. Okay. That's about it. Thank you. So my comment is is really just on the resident's house um, that that there is a shortage of meeting space, like you mentioned, and we did get public comment uh, via email about the shortage of meeting room spaces. So um, I understand we need to balance how much it would cost to renovate. So I would just um, want to see how much it would be to to make the like to address the flooding issue. Um, with the parking, I'm pretty open to either of the three, any of the three parking Thank you. options. Thank you. Um, I'd like to echo what Councilmember Lamb says about the, um, about the buildings. Um, I'm coming down on concept two again, the whimsy and discovery. 
and echo what's been said already about that. Um, also with public comment, and I'm assuming that you're all the, the emails that we received are being passed on to yeah. you. Um, there were several emails about maintaining the residence, about providing more meeting spaces as a community. There was also a comment about um, a nursery in a greenhouse that is temporarily being housed at Beaver Lake and that maybe we would find a more permanent uh, home for, for that and maybe Big Rock Park South would be the place. Um, because we, we, you know, we mentioned this idea about a botanical garden and that that's not really, we're not talking about big, you know, elaborate greenhouses, but maybe we're talking more about pollinator gardens and more native plantings. And I think in um, being kind of an avid gardener myself, that seems to be where gardening is going, where we're talking more about pollinators and bees and attracting more insects into our own gardens, um, having less grass, more, um, more space for our native plants to, to thrive. And I think that, that Big Rock Park South kind of provides us with this wonderful opportunity. I'm in favor of maintaining all the buildings. And I think with that one garage that we have a question mark over that um, it, um, converting that into another use seems like a really good idea. Of course, dollars will always will decide. I just have to talk about the barn that's on the site. It's an incredible space with the most beautiful chicken has I've ever seen. <laughs> Just, you know, incredible. And the stained glass windows. And I mean, what child is not going to want to come over and see that? And it's like a live dollhouse. And I think that's like an incredible gift to the city. And we should find some way of preserving and using that because it just, that to me, if we're going to do something on whimsy and discovery, I mean, that... Yeah. That in itself is the essence of whimsy and discovery. So um, I'm really in favor of that. Um, I hope you get to read all the public comments. Um, and yeah, that's me. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Mary would actually like to say something. So I just wanted to say that I lived in that house for almost 50 years. And it does not have a single doorway that matches any other doorway. None of them are wide enough to be accessible. It has stairs that are too narrow and too steep. It has a basement that in spite of nearly 50 years of trying, I could not make it stay dry. It's the indoor swimming pool. And um, it, it, I would not be at all hurt to have it get knocked down. It was built by bootleggers in the 20s and it was absolutely a homemade house. It was a great place to have it was a great place to raise kids, but it is, it seems to me, this is a very personal response, it seems to me an inappropriate for anything else. I mean, it's just, it's not worth it. It is so not worth the dollars. Um, and I had that chicken coop made by an artist. Um, what would you do if you could just, that sky's the limit, build me a chicken house? And I used to have art scattered all over the place. And I think that's, but you do have to think about uh, cows hitting them and things like that, because they do. Thank you. And that, that, does, write, that does remind me um, that one of the things that I didn't mention is um, on all of the buildings, the upper floors would not be usable because we cannot make them accessible. So that is um, just one other sort of context and there's a lot of detail that I can't talk about in a short period of time, but that is one that's probably important to mention, including in the barn. That upper level is really just will never be accessible. So um, it is the main floor that we're talking about. Okay, thank you. Where were we? Uh, so I do think the, the barn, there are some great opportunities there, even if we are limited um, to the first floor. Um, also, the pool house, um, I was very impressed when I saw that. That's pretty much ready-made meeting space. I know that's not going to meet every community need that we have, um, but I think that is, that's going to be a great amenity for us. Um, the residents, it sounds like from the source, uh, maybe there's some, uh, some challenges there. Uh, even, even before that, I think, I, I know we have a demonstrated community need. We had a lot of, of comment about meeting space. Um, it seems like perhaps there are, are different opportunities. The, uh, for the greenhouse, uh, so the native plant stewards were initially propagating plants from the native plant salvages at their houses, and then we worked with the city to get temporary storage at Beaver Lake Park, and that has been fantastic. It's been definitely um, 
a lessening of a burden on our stewards to have that space. And I think at the time that was communicated that that would be kind of a temporary thing. And it was years ago suggested that it might go, uh, a more permanent facility might go on Big Rock Park South. So I don't know if that's still seen as a good opportunity, but I, I would definitely like to see that pursued if it is appropriate. I think that's all I have. All right, thank you. Well, after your comment, now I'm like, okay, concept three. Um, <laughs> yeah, because the residence is beautiful and the addition is so cool and those built-ins, I'm like, that wood inside there is just gorgeous. Um, so the only reason I was in three, um, like what Melanie said, the, uh, I almost had like the opposite because I'm like, oh, the parking just seems so intrusive, except in three, it seems like you get the most parking spots and it doesn't go all the way back. And then I failed to realize, of course, it would be nice to be able to get like halfway through. Um, and I do, um, like Sid, like you mentioned, um, the greenhouses, you know, if, if the pea patch is better at Beaton, I think that pea patch tool shed area, if that could be the greenhouse section, I'm not sure if that would work. Um, and then just, yeah, hitting home that sensory and universal play, I think will be really important. Um, do we need to pause and, and discuss the greenhouse at all um, as we come through this? I think, uh, I, I know I mentioned this previously, but the, um, building a new structure as a greenhouse on Big Rock South would actually be very difficult and even housed in that open space between the tree, the, the apple trees and the apple orchard, the parking that we're trying to kind of get in an access drive and getting accessible parking to the pool house is gonna take some of that space. Um, there is some better places I think that we're looking for in the city to, to house that. Yes, we do have on our CI or our proposed CIP to identify a future location for a permanent greenhouse. Okay, thank you. Okay, I take that back. And then I just had one other question. Uh, I know the pool house, the restrooms might be an accessibility issue, so I was just curious on the cost when you guys come back. Yeah, um, we can do that when we come back. We have uh, looked at the space plan and what we're gonna need to do to make it. Actually, the pool house has some of the, the, the larger outside of the residence is the, the biggest change that needs to happen to make that inaccessible. Um, and so we will have some cost developed for those. I think we need to be, in, we just completed a big retrofit of existing tennis courts to turn them into pickleball. And maybe Kevin can enlighten us if he's still here to tell us that we, we have added a bunch of new pickleball courts to the city's supply just recently. So uh, how many is that Kevin, if you're still here? Yes, we did an overlay, and so I believe there are four pickleball courts, but we don't have any dedicated pickleball courts in the city of Sammamish. Okay, cool. okay so that's okay. that's are good to know. They were just retrofitted. Just, just finished. Just, just finished. Just, just finished. finished. Just finished. Just finished. Yeah. Yeah, Anjali is the captain, so. <laughs> um, despite what Mary has said, I. I'm um, really supportive in, in, of keeping the house. We look for something in a park that makes it unique. And as you drive up that walk, that, that uh, entry, and you see that house and the barn, you get a sense of the place. Without the house there, it's you're just not going to get the same. And that big front porch, you're just not going to get the same feeling as to what makes the spot unique. So. Um, uh, I want this to be a different kind of a looking park. Uh, and I think that that really helps with that. So, uh, and then reflecting on the need for meeting space. I think we can make that a warm place. Uh, it's been well maintained despite its challenges as an older house. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm strongly in favor of that. Um, so I, I would never in my life would I say that I support whimsy and discovery because I don't like the word whimsy, but there I am, I'm, I'm supporting <laughs> it. So, um, and this, the sinuosity of the parking lot here is just so lovely, uh, giving accessibility throughout the site. Uh, I really, I really like that. Um, I wonder if we could think about, if we can't, if we're trying to do too much at Beaton, we can't create uh, the pea patch in that big open lawn area uh, and we might have to enlarge the parking there a little bit to give ex access to that if we can't uh, fit the, it just seems like farming goes with this site, you know. It does at Beaton Hill too, but um, 
it just seems to all flow from the barn and the animals, and it seems like that might be a good spot for a pea patch. Um, the other, the one thing um, I'm a little disappointed about is that Mary has has really embraced uh, sustainability in her use of the house and, and garages with all those solar panels and a very sophisticated solar system. And if we couldn't make some, that some kind of a demonstration mm -hmm. to inspire people to, you know, we could power all the city's maintenance equipment with solar power from that garage. That might inspire people to use uh, and do, do more solar inst inst installations themselves. Um, let's see. In terms of the botanical garden, we, we have a contingent in the city that's really, really wanting to have what they're calling botanical garden, but it isn't like a place that you go to pay money. They just want to identify the plants on the site. They want to offer education. And I think they dream of seeing the, the house as a place to do some of that education. So um, that's something to think about there. I look at that beautiful barn and I see Christmas or holiday <laughs> fair inside. Because where do we have a big space like that where people can gather in the winter out of the storm and be together. So I'm very excited about the barn. And imagining maybe we could have some kind of a lift type elevator. To, I mean, I know that's going to be very expensive to get into those that upper floor so that we can use that beautiful wooded panel space. So I'm, I'm very excited about the structures. And then the, tra the trails are ready made. What can we say? Um, thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad, Mary. Thank you for coming up and giving comment because I was really torn. First of all, even just discussing it in front of you felt awkward um, <laughs> because it was your house. Um, I do, though, recall very distinctly you telling us the challenges when it rained and how you had to get out and, and turn that sump pump on and all the different challenges. So um, I think the overarching feedback is we need... Uh, gathering and meeting spaces, um, and we need to do it in the most cost-effective manner possible. If there are ways to keep some of those elements and, and whatever, um, I think that would be great. Um, there are ways, right, to kind of reclaim certain things, so um, I think we just have to look at, at mm. a balance and a practicality there, um, and I think that would be important. I'm going to steal the mayor's. I think we need whimsy for everyone, again, um, because I think that there are elements of the whimsy and discovery and elements of the play playful space for everyone that I like. Um, again, I think the more we can have universal play areas um, along with our covered spaces and our meeting spaces, um, I do like the idea. Uh, I'll, I'll just say this. From a parking perspective, you should do whatever gives us the most parking. Um, I think that there are some definite advantages, right, to having parking that goes into the park to make it easier for accessibility. I think that's obviously also a big um, concern because again, everything should be accessible, everything should be designed with everyone in mind. Um, and again, it's not just physical abilities, but um, all kinds of challenges there. So I think that's really important. Um, yeah, big open, um, I think in the in the age of COVID, one of the things we've learned is having gathering and meeting spaces that maybe don't have four walls, but just have a roof can also be really important. So uh, I definitely like that. And more pea patches. Why not do pea patches in both places? I, it sounds like we have enough of a waiting list that that wouldn't necessarily go to waste. Um, wherever we're going to put the the place for our uh, native plant stewards to, to house their plants, um, the idea that it's on a list of something we're going to do in the future makes me a little nervous. So if there is a place we can give them here, because um, we're doing this now, um, sooner the better, because they have been in a temporary location for a long time, and if you're on a list too far down, we may never get to you. So those would be, um, I think that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Like Pam, I was ambivalent about keeping the house um, until Mary spoke, and I don't see value in, in keeping it at this point. I do like the idea of repurposing the old garage uh, and transforming it in an open picnic area. I think that has tremendous value. Unlike others, I think I prefer the parking design in the uh, playful space. I think, um, to me, it takes up, it consolidates the parking in a, in a small corner and has less of an impact on the overall uh, feeling of the park. Uh, to me, the, the one on Whimsy is it extends too far into the park. Yes, I think you need accessibility, but the parking on um, the Plan 3, the um, playful space, does have uh, handicap access further, uh, further to the north. Also, 
if you look at the, how, the, the long one on Whimsy, if you're looking for an open parking spot, uh, you have to travel quite a long distance and then you end up, let's say the parking lot's full, you go all the way up to the roundabout, you turn around, you come all the way back down, whereas it's much more consolidated, you make a much smaller loop in the uh, uh, parking space for playful space. So um, that's the one I prefer there. Um, but I agree with many of the other comments about the um, pea patches and um, the play spaces for all. Thank you. So I'm voting for whimsy and discovery. Um, Thank you for the grace of giving us your house. I just wonder, can we like have it used as a residence? Could a park ranger live there? Could, could it be a residence? I'm just at, that's, don't answer that now, but I'm just wondering, you know, can it be used differently than perhaps we'd already envisioned? Um, I do hate to take down the structures that have been there and do add character, I think, to the space. Um, and we need, frankly, we need the meeting space for now. So, so if the basement floods, so it's a pain in the ass. So, I mean, can it be mitigated? I don't know. Um, Make it the new pool house. The new pool house. <laughs> <laughs> There's that. Uh, I, you know, when I think of things like the Vera Project, or I think of things like uh, the fire station. So I think of places that it, you turn it into what you want it to be, and you put up with the the weirdness of the space. I do realize that there's ADA considerations and I do appreciate that. Um, and I'm just asking, you know, are there other options? So that that's my, it's just a question. Um, I do like the parking on concept three better. It's more spaces. Um, and the other thing that I'll be looking for is uh, you, you told us that roughly they're about the same to construct. However, they may not be the same to maintain. And so I'll, that will be the next question that I'll have is just what is the maintenance costs over time? And what reliance work are we going to have on volunteer organizations and so forth? Thank you. I should also qualify when I say they're about the same cost that excludes anything related to the buildings because there's clearly the buildings have much different costs between the different concepts. But the site work between them all is relatively similar. All right. Great. Um, I don't have a whole lot to add. I think I'm leaning toward concept three for the layout um, with adding more whimsy and discovery just for the kids to keep them engaged in the site. I think that will be really fun. Um, I didn't have a strong opinion about the residents. Um, I appreciate uh, Mary speaking. Um, I appreciate uh, Nancy's view on it as uh, adding a lot of uniqueness to the site, and it just kind of hurts my heart to like destroy yeah. an old house. But um, yeah, I think that's a hard one. I'm still kind of torn about it. I love the barn, though. I think that's a really great opportunity there. I'm excited. Thank you. Uh, Big Rock Park South. This property should be a natural area with beautiful gardens. Um, it needs to include community meeting amenities for all residents of all ages. So I would be in favor of uh, enhancing, upgrading, or reusing, or I don't know if I, and reuse the structures to fit the different needs. Um, so kind of down to more of a technical look at it too, I was thinking that if, if the house were to stay, which I think would be important, uh, the water is the issue. So when we look at the stormwater issue, the gradient and active one has the best plan for that. I think, Kevin, you would agree with that, uh, with me on that. So it then leads me to, well, what's the possibility of doing that whimsical and discovery driveway, removing, uh, with the removal of the garage in a sense, uh, on the gradient and active one, can we incorporate a better stormwater facilities either up, upstream on the property to, to gather the water, or then how do we solve this problem on the down, uh, downward slope and into that corner where you're actually gonna put concrete asphalt and impervious surface? Um, so, but I, I think that's the, whimsical driveways, the answer, I mean, you're gonna run uh, emergency vehicles up all the way up that way anyway. Uh, I mean, it's, it's all grout, it's, it's, it's there already exists, so. 
go ahead and take the driveway all the way up past the barn. It's a good idea. Um, if you take the house out, you know, does that then make it so I can fix my fix the stormwater pro problem completely? Then, then I say that I would at least entertain that idea, even though it would be my second choice. Um, because I like the ability of keeping the house on the property for meeting. And if, if a group was to come in like the Botanical Garden Society or the Seniors or the Heritage Society or a Cub Scout, Boy Scout groups, whatever organization's gonna come in, wants to rent the facility or use the facility, it, it, it's just super cool. So I, I, would, I would first start with keeping it and seeing if we could solve the stormwater issue through natural, you know, working on the topography while we're doing this project. Yep. Keep Absolutely. it natural though, it's beautiful. Thank you. I can address just really quickly and briefly the, um, the flooding. Um, Mary will be happy to know there is a solution to not have to hand do the, the valve uh, every flood. Uh, there is an automatic system now that is extensive to, to install, but it will tie into the city system. And so we're looking um, at, the, at those elements there is a lot we can do once you start to move some heavy equipment and know that it's flooding to redirect floodwaters and provide some capacity for those floodwaters. Um, from early indications, the house will likely always flood to some extent in the basement. Um, there is underground, I mean, you're just, it's just the way the, it's a high water table site, there will always be some flooding in that basement um, to get rid of it entirely is just, at least at an early master planning stage, not something I would ever try to commit to. Um, the rest of the site, you know, is we can do some, a lot to help it though. So it's a coke and Zuni job. <laughs> <laughs> Without the actual cook and uh, sound that happens quite as much. <laughs> do we need the basement? Can we just fill the basement? I we can come back with some other, so I've also, and I, I wanna get to you um, for those last pieces. So maybe pause for a second and I'll kind of talk a little bit about some of our next steps and what we can do and come back with and then let's kind of get through this last one. All right, thank you. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Mary in regards to her donation. This is new to me and it's wonderful. It's, it's just absolutely grows my heart 10 times and to get to go see the property, appreciate the property um, and, and fall in love with the property, being on the Parks Commission was real, real joy. Um, with that being said, I was not comfortable in the house. Uh, it was uneven walkways. If you put a marble in the middle, it will roll all the way to either side, so there's no balance. You can't go up and down the stairs. Um, it, it, with again, no disrespect to anybody, it's, it's um, very old and musty, so it is something about the idea if we are gonna have seniors meeting there, older people meeting in there, anybody meeting in there, uh, there could be a compromise to that in that regard. Um, I love Nancy's um, passion for the um, for the house and its presence on the land. I think that, that that comment really resonated with me, although I'm about getting the house out of there. Um, <laughs> what I would like to say with that um, passion is, I also like the idea, is there a way we could keep maybe the porch and maybe we could keep the look and, and keep some of that wonderful wood as uh, Mayor Clark mentioned. And so we don't have to scrap it all and throw it in the garbage. But I don't think the house is conducive in the long run for the growth that we're looking to be able to support the meeting spaces. And I know uh, also that we are talking about Beaton and Big Rock, but I would like to say one small thing about the meeting spaces as I've heard this so consistently. There is massive open lawns at Beaver Lake. And if we're gonna put in uh, uh, meeting spaces, why not slab, pole, and roof three different larger areas that you could wall off and put doors in on Beaver Lake in these open lawns that I never see anybody on. Um, so we have other places that we could very much encourage a meeting and gathering and being in a park setting and maybe the house is the only one particular thing in this environment that may, maybe isn't the safest thing to keep. Um, but I appreciate the passion uh, that everybody has about it. Um, so I'm not necessarily in favor of keeping the house, um, but I am in favor of uh, adding tons of uh, meeting spaces around Sammamish for folks to gather. Um, I did have one other question I'd like to ask you if I may. In the open lawn on Big Rock and the um, area that you're devoting to the dog park on Beaton, are they roughly the same size or is there a big difference in that um, square footage? Um, I wanna say, uh, 
I don't know because they're different scales. Okay. You can't you can't compare them just by glancing at them, which I was gonna try to do as well before. <laughs> I remember do you they do the are in with fact the at different yeah. scales. Yeah. Um, and I guess the, I should explain the reason I'm asking is because I do, I am aware that um, dogs' uh, feces leave disease and it can penetrate the groundwater. And if you're trying to grow veg on the below topography of a dog park being above, I would think maybe that the edible pea patch versus the flower would maybe be offset. So if you're going to do flowers, maybe that's where the dog park is. And if you're gonna do food, maybe that's not where the dog park is. I'm sure you guys could mitigate and contain, but it is an ecosystem. So that would be my only concern. I mean, when I walk the trail, I tell people don't pick berries below your knees, you know, cause that's where the dogs go. So it's like, if you're gonna go and pick berries and stuff, or if you're gonna eat things, you don't want that to be decimated by, you know, the surrounding groundwater that could be penetrated by, uh, by that. So that's just my small comment on that, but thank you. Thank you. All right. I just had one quick follow up from Council Member Andapore. She wanted to follow up on what Nancy was saying about the, the house and that the bootlegger backstory gives a sense of history and adventure to the structure. Uh, and so I assume what she was referring to is, you know, you could stash booze in there, uh, but I might be wrong. I might be wrong. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> I think it adds to that whimsy, right? The stories, uh, it's the whimsy. It's the stories that you hear that we wanna find a way to, to integrate, right? The, the, the stained glass is so unique and so beautiful and you can, we, we probably can't really keep the whole chicken coop as a chicken coop, but we can take that stained glass and really kind of highlight it elsewhere, right? It's just beautiful. Uh, real quick to your point about that, what about the idea of taking some of these really beautiful components of it and then setting them up within the park as part of that educational? So like that story and, and the things that really excite people about the park, maybe those components, they can be set up as, you know, like when you go to a park and they explain the history of, and we could do that throughout the park would be kind of nice and then it would be remembered, safe and revered. Mary, I'm gonna put you on the spot and you might hate me for this, but I just think we need to do some, um, you know, kind of like StoryCorps does on NPR. We need to get some videos. We need to sit down with Mary and have her tell us some of these stories and capture them um, and have that be part of our educational um, programming that we can have at our park. So um, she's given me the evil eye, so I'm not gonna suggest that anymore in public, but um, maybe that's something we can work on. <laughs> Excellent. Mary is more than willing. Thank you, Mary. I think that would be amazing. I was going to mention it. I would love to sit down with you and just have a whole conversation and get that recorded. I think that would be the most amazing thing ever. I can't get through a whole story. All right. Um, I know we're running late, and given where the conversation is devolving to, I think we've got what we need. <laughs> I do want to go through a couple of things just to make sure I've heard this pretty um, consistently, because um, I have had the pleasure to listen to the story that Mary told to Shelby uh, in order to convey it to me, so um, I really appreciate that too. So on our discussion patches, I think we've covered everything pretty well. Um, what I will talk about with the residents, I think there's definitely been some back and forth with the residents. Um, we are looking at, we've, got a, we've, we've done enough to kind of look at what it would take to make it accessible. Uh, on that main floor, get the entry in, all sorts of things. There's been some really interesting ideas about the porch, like we love the porch, we love this character. Maybe there's some creative things we can do to kind of reflect some of that without reflecting the whole building. And I've also heard kind of loud and clear that we need to really think about the costs of that particular structure um, as we think about what to, to keep or to not keep. So I'm, I'm not coming away with this with an absolute keep or an absolute remove. I'm coming away with, there's a little bit more background that we need to provide to think about the best approach to that particular structure. I'm hearing we're all in agreement on the rest of them. I'm not seeing any no's for that. Um, and I think the parking in general I'm recognizing and I think what's what we as designers have kind of approached with this whimsy is the importance of just making sure we get accessibility in. But I think as you know, parking has to support the use and as everything else starts to coalesce, we'll come back with parking that kind of maximizes what we can between between the three and the, um, and the, the whimsy in the middle and, and, and just kind of work the site that way. 
I don't think I'm hearing anything in particular else that um, is contrary or that we didn't talk about. I'm not hearing a huge, yes, we need pea patches in both places other than a couple of comments, but that is something I think we'll come back with a recommendation as well. Did I miss anything in particular? Shelby, did I miss anything that we needed direction on? All right, so online, I don't wanna forget to just make sure we have the, the chance to see if is there anything else from our online? Nope, I'm seeing heads shaking now. All right, thank you very much. Our next steps, really quickly, before you go, so you know what's coming. Uh, dates and times of future meetings. I know it's running late, so <laughs> they're coming and they'll get to you. Um, we are gonna go away and we're gonna basically create a preferred plan. We will then come back with that preferred plan to a series of public workshops. We'll have another community online survey about the preferred plan to see how well we did coming down from six to, to two. Um, and then come back to you with all of that feedback as well to try and coalesce to what will eventually be a final plan for each site. Um, and we're looking to get all of that kind of back by the end of the year with some adoption probably into 2023. And I have one more question. Does that include cost when you come back? Uh, estimates? Yes, we will have cost estimates. There is always some, like it's a preferred plan. Usually it's a preferred plan with a little A or B in some little area over here um, if we're not really fully vested in one option versus another. So I'm not gonna say there won't be any sub options or some minutia of, of decisions that we'll still need, but we will have costs associated with that. And we do look at maintenance of those facilities as well. All right, I don't think I missed anything. So thank you all, it's a long night. I love it when you all come together because it makes my job easier even. So thank you very much. Yeah, so thank you all to staff and um, the commission for joining us. This is really great. Uh, so I think we will now break. We're about an hour late. So <laughs> we will break until 8 p.m. and we'll all move up there to continue our city council meeting. So thank you. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started as I get my Zoom up in a moment uh, here. Madam Mayor, I just have to unmute us real quick. Okay. Thank you. All right, we're all good? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started as my Zoom uploads here in just a second. Okay, um, all, right. all right, welcome back. Um, so first we're going to do a special recognition. Uh, am I handing that off to you? Yeah, great, thank you, Scott. Yes, Mayor, uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. This evening I'd like to call um, Sergeant Elias and her team up to the podium really quickly, if that would be okay. Um, I've asked Sergeant Elias to come along with our new chief to do some introductions. And uh, I wanna kick it off by saying, really appreciative to Sergeant Elias and the whole team. Sergeant Elias uh, stepped in and was acting chief uh, during the time period where we were going through our recruitment and she did a phenomenal job. So I wanna say thank you and I'd like to turn it over to her for some introductions of her team and our new chief. Thank you. Thank you. So here with us today is our two, three of our swing shift um, deputies. We have George Davis, Jennifer Herr, and Ian Campbell. And so they're here to, to cheer on our new chief, Steve Lysat, who we're really super excited is joining us. He's going to be a great addition to our group, and and we're we're excited to have him on board. I'm really excited to have him on board too. <laughs> and then I have something for you. Our Sammamish patches, oh, our coin, our challenge coin, and our pin. So, welcome to the team. Thank you very much. You're Good evening. Um, thank you very much, City Manager McCall, Mayor Clark, Deputy Mayor Lamb, and the entire council for putting your trust in me to lead your city. I'm 
very excited for this unique opportunity. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, Colorado native, went to Colorado State University, came to the Sheriff's Office in 2002, and I've worked here for now almost 21 years. Um, background in investigations, and uh, upon promoting went to internal investigations and was a patrol supervisor in the city of Shoreline. And I'm currently, or have been, the uh, investigation supervisor for King County Metro Investigations. Um, part of what brought me here, I think, was that I've spent 15 years in Klahani, 10 years as the director of public safety. This is an amazing community, and I'm just so thrilled at this opportunity. Um, I would be remiss if I did not mention um, how thankful I am to Sergeant Elias for the last four months of service to the community as the acting captain. She's done a tremendous job. The, the entire sheriff's office knows how great she's been. And so I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for her patience um, and for her willingness to bring me up to speed. So we hit the ground running on Monday. And Dan Pingree sends his best. He can't be here. Uh, he has another commitment, but um, also for his service to the city, he was a tremendous leader and a mentor to me. So again, thank you all for this opportunity. I'm incredibly excited about this. Is there, are there any questions I can, can answer for you? Of course, I was gonna make a joke, but I will not. Um, <laughs> welcome, thank you. I can't see you through this plexiglass, so I'm just leaning this way. Um, yeah, I really appreciate it. And yeah, Christine, obviously. You're the best, so thank you so much. Um, you really did a lot for us. I know we've been a little wobbly, so we're looking, really looking forward to the, to the stability. Um, and thank you for your service in Klahani too. Um, that's an area I'm not super familiar with because I'm on this side, but that'll be so helpful. You've basically been you know, in charge of mini Sammamish, which is great, so. It's a very special yeah. project. Yeah, so thank you all, and thank you all for coming too. It's nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so next we'll go to public comment. I thought we did have somebody earlier in the room that may have escaped. Okay, yeah. And then online, um, I think if anyone is ready, they can raise their hand as Krista gets back. If you'd like to make public comment, please raise your hand. Okay, I do not see anyone. All right, thank you all so much. We're gonna move to our presentations, or actually these are pro proclamations. So first we have emergency preparedness. Um, is anybody that would like to read this one? I will do it if not. Um, all right, so Emergency Preparedness Month, September 2022. Uh, whereas the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the importance of individual, family, and business readiness and community resiliency, and Emergency Preparedness Month creates an important opportunity for every resident of Sammamish to prepare their homes, businesses, and communities for any type of emergency, including natural and human-caused disasters, and investing in the preparedness of ourselves, our families, businesses, and communities can reduce fatalities and economic devastation in our community. And the City of Sammamish, private businesses, and volunteer agencies are working to increase public activities in preparing for emergencies and to educate individuals on how to take action and emergency preparedness is the responsibility of every citizen of Sammamish and all citizens are urged to make a preparedness a priority and work together as a team to ensure that individuals, families, and communities are prepared for disasters and emergencies of any type. And all citizens of Sammamish are encouraged to participate in citizen preparedness activities, such as making and practicing emergency plans, having two weeks of emergency supplies, and participating in community emergency response team or CERT training offered by the City of Sammamish. Now, therefore, it be it resolved that I, Mayor Kaylee Clark, and the Sammamish City Council do hereby announce and proclaim September 2022 as Emergency Preparedness Month. Okay, so next we have National Recovery Month. Is anyone interested in reading that one? I have I'll it. Do it. Oh. Right. 
Whereas behavioral health is an essential part of one's overall health and wellness, and whereas prevention of mental and substance use disorders works, treatment is effective and recovery is possible, and whereas recovery is a process and that people recover in our local area and around the nation, and whereas preventing and overcoming mental and substance use disorders is essential to achieving healthy lifestyles, both physically and emotionally, and whereas an estimated 400,000 people in King County are affected by these conditions, and whereas we must encourage relatives and friends of people with mental and or substance use disorders to implement preventative measures, recognize the signs of a problem, and guide those in need to appropriate treatment and recovery support services. And whereas we recognize four dimensions of recovery from mental health and substance use disorders, health, home, purpose, and community, and whereas to help more people achieve and sustain long-term recovery, the US Department of Health and Human Services, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, King County and Washington State invite all residents of the city of Sammamish to participate in National Recovery Month. Now, therefore, Mayor Kaylee Clark, on behalf of the Sammamish City Council, do hereby proclaim month of September 2022 as National Recovery Month. Great, thank you. Okay, so new business. Um, I believe, Scott, you'll be kicking this off for department budget reviews. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor, and appreciate the opportunity this evening um, to try something a little bit different that we haven't done before for council. Uh, and tonight we are starting, um, we're going to intro the budget process tonight. We're kicking it off earlier than in previous years, but in part, what we wanna be able to do is to provide a little bit more interaction with council and to do a little more educating as we go to get us all the way through the budget process. Um, and so we are trying this out and so looking for obviously for council feedback as we go to make sure we're hitting the mark, but we also wanna uh, be able to provide information to you all in timely fashion. So tonight we are starting off, and uh, tonight is the what I would call the um, setting the base, or our this is our our base budget, the way it is today. And what you'll be seeing is that budget plus, if you add inflation to it, that's what it will look like. So that's the base budget. And then as we move forward, the next time around we'll come back. We'll be talking about proposed adds to the budget. And then the third piece we'll be talking about our capital budget. And then at the end, we will come back to you with the overall connected, if you will, budget for your review um, and consideration. So these are the, um, the ongoing iterative components. And as we move into these, uh, bear with us when we get to these points because we're gonna be switching between um, our finance team and our department directors to talk about their specific components to help you understand. Uh, and I wanna say a big thank you first off to all the staff. A lot of work has gone into this finance staff and all the, at the department levels to get us to this point earlier than we normally do. Um, I really appreciate the whole team chipping in and getting us here because this is a, a heavy lift anyway. And I asked to do this earlier than normal so that we could have these conversations. So for tonight, Mike, if you would skip to the next slide. So tonight, I um, wanted to talk about what we're doing tonight is the, uh, just sort of went through the overall process overview and timeline. And then tonight we're gonna be going over the base budget, which will be fund overview, the general fund by department reviews, the ending fund balances, and then the capital and other city funds just to give, to set the base. Uh, Mike, if you would. So um, starting with, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about where um, we were thinking of, I was thinking of from the policy perspective about putting the budget together. And the goal obviously is long-term financial sustainability. Given that, we also recognize that based on our conversation last June for the long-term fiscal sustainability, that we are going to be balancing this year's budget using, or this biennial budget, using fund balance. 
that we know there's a fiscal gap that our revenues do not meet our expenditures. Um, the budget reflects the currently approved work plan and to get to Council Member Stewart asked her quite, quite great question earlier in the day. It also, we are moving to incorporate the council priorities from the goal setting retreat. And uh, forgive us, we are doing it a little bit in real time, but we wanna make sure to capture that as part of the budget as we move forward. I will tell you, you will likely see a lot more of that in two weeks than you will tonight, just to be upfront. Um, it will reflect the direction from the financial sustainability discussion in no small part about maintaining services and staffing levels. That is one comment we did hear from council and so that you will see that reflected in what is being brought forward. Uh, it assumes that we are, will be fully staffed for the biennium and that was not the case over the last two and a half years with the pandemic. Um, there will not be, we're not planning for salary savings to be available to do other things. We are very close as of today to being almost fully staffed and we intend on continuing down that path with a couple of very few really tough to fill positions. Basically when something opens up, we're trying to fill it as soon as possible. So that is both a positive and it also takes away some of that flexibility that was available previously. I would also add, and I know you are all aware that our current economic climate has, is putting a lot of pressure on everyone's budget. And you will see that reflected uh, tonight in particular in a couple of different areas. When we get to them, they will be very clear to you what is going on with the, the increases in those base budgets. But um, to put it short, uh, the current economy, economic climate is challenging. So with that, um, Aaron and his team, when pulling this together, they took a conservative approach to revenue. Uh, and um, so we are assuming existing revenue resources in the, in the base budget. So that means there are no new revenue options assumed, just what we've used previously. Uh, we will be, or I will be recommending using the full 1% uh, property tax increase and you are all considering increasing the stormwater fee by a minimum of the base level of 3%, possibly higher depending on what the outcome of the final stormwater conversation goes for level of service. Um, the capital revenues will be reflected as forecasted back in July. Development revenues are based on the Department of Com Community Development forecast and inflation is based on the uh, what I would consider to be very high CPIU increase of 10.1% in our fee schedule. But that is reality and that's what we have to deal with. In terms of our expenditures, again, the base budget incorporates those inflationary increases. There is a 10.1% CPIU. Um, we will be recommending and needing to use 4.8 million for the biennium, that's over two years in fund balance to balance the budget, the base budget. Um, our personnel costs are reflective of a four year average, so they are not the full 10.1%. However, they do reflect a 4.7% COLA in 2023 and a 5.0% 5 5 COLA in 2024. Um, I will say that, that those reflect the, uh, our uh, collective bargaining agreement. That's part of the collective bargaining agreement. That is a council choice for non-represented employees. It also incorporates the recent council approved plans that have financial impact. Two that, that are uh, the easiest to point to are the transportation capital improvement plan which reflects using fund balance to fund a portion of the capital investment every year in transportation and whatever the final decision comes with stormwater rates that council will be deciding on here in the next uh, month. All right, so the rest of the council budget calendar, we started a couple weeks ago with the goal setting retreat. And again, I wanna thank you all for participating in that and giving us some really good direction there. Uh, last week you had, uh, you gave more direction on stormwater rates and what program level you want. Tonight is our base budget workshop. Two weeks from now will be the recommended increase to the base budget. 
Uh, and then October 4th, we'll be discussing the capital funds budgets and the stormwater utility rates. And then our official public hearing on the budget and the property tax ordinance will be November 1st with the goal of uh, actually passing those two, those two ordinances and council adoption of the budget on November 15th. So that's the schedule that we're laying out. As you will notice, it leaves a lot of time in between for us to make any necessary changes that reflect council feedback and direction as we go. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron and uh, Reflection of the Finance team and ask him to take it away. Thank you, Aaron. All right, so just going right into the 2023-2024 base budget. Uh, one of those core operating principles that we use is we staff at the core level, so those are the city staff, and then there's core contracted services, so you can think of police and fire or your core services that are contracted, and then we layer on top of that supplemental staffing and contracts uh, depending on the workload elements. So those are the pieces of the base budget. So what we're reflecting here is the comparison between 21-22, uh, adopted council budget and 23-24 proposed. So that's gonna be our general overall comparison. So first, let's take a look at the fund organization chart. So when we talk budgeting, every fund has a specific purpose that's outlined by the state uh, so that we meet those purposes for those particular funds. So this chart puts together those accounting terms into a organization chart so you can see what is referred to as a capital fund and which of these funds are referred to as operating funds. So uh, just quickly, the capital funds, we think of as the general capital fund 301, the parks capital fund 302, and the transportation capital 340. You'll recall from Scott's earlier comments that we're gonna dive deeper into those in a, a couple weeks in October for the capital funds. General fund, general fund 001, that's the general purpose uh, fund of the city. That's where the large majority of all your departments uh, reside in that general fund. So that's what we're gonna cover and, and go through tonight uh, on a by department view. So again, the state requires it by fund level. We're showing it by department level so you can actually see the the names and people behind that, kind of pulling back the curtain and uh, showing the operations at a by department viewpoint. So also we did add a ARPA revenue recovery fund. Uh, so that was added into the 23-24 proposed budget as well. So that's a separate fund uh, for receiving in the ARPA revenue recovery dollars. Uh, those are federal dollars that were received into that separate fund. So those are held separately from the general fund. Then the other operating pieces, stormwater capital, we talked about that surface water management fund that has an operating and a capital piece. So those are laid out. And then the internal service funds are operating components as well. So these three funds, the equipment rental fund, the technology fund, and the risk management fund, really for all intents and purposes are operating in nature, but they are titled uh, from an accounting standpoint as internal service funds because they, they don't have their own independent resource of revenue. They pull from the revenue resources of the general fund. Okay, so uh, from a big picture overview, we're estimating the beginning fund balance, and this is without that strategic reserve. So recall that council had a 10% uh, strategic reserve policy, so that's 5.5 million. So the estimated beginning fund balance in 2023 without that 5.5 million is 39.3 million, okay, so that's our starting point. We already talked briefly about the 4.8 million, that was the net fund balance impact of the base budget adds, so largely inflationary base, but it's that's the net amount that's hitting the fund balance. Then in addition to that, there was a transfer out of the general fund to fund facilities capital and that's primarily for the use of the fire station that's planned for in the general capital 301 fund. So that's how the fund balance is being used in the base fund. If you track that all the way down, so the remaining available balance would be 24 million. So that's kind of your starting point into that, that picture. All right, so then we're gonna go in further into the general fund. That's our focus tonight. 
Uh, so that, go ahead and flip the next slide here. Here's the overview of all of those operating department, or op operating funds by department. So this is your by department view. Very busy slide. So this just has it all on one page for you. So it's more for a reference to come back to. So tonight we're gonna go through each one of these lines. So let me just start with saying the comparison is the 21-22 adopted budget. So that's what we're currently operating in reflected by department. So each of the departments are listed on the left, their adopted 21-22 budget, and then we're comparing that with the proposed 23-24 budget, that's the base budget for 23-24. And then there's gonna be a, a difference. So each of these of course have a story behind them. So we'll go through those stories as we go through each of the department heads covering their different uh, department areas. I'd also point out here, obviously, police and fire services, largest uh, operating fund departments. So that's something to highlight too. They're also the uh, largest um, in, in terms of the dollar difference. So what's changing between the adopted budget and the proposed. So fairly typical, but that, that is the current profile that we have on just the base budget uh, increasing for inflation. So the next slide goes into a, a pie chart, breaking that down so you can see what those kind of uh, visually shows it in a little different fashion so you can see which departments are the, the largest of those operating funds. I would note here that the Public Works Department, even though it's showing 17%, uh, that's, th there's several elements to that. You'll get into it on the Public Works Variance Explanation. So uh, I'm just highlighting here that there's more to that story on public works as it's just not a straight 17% of the general fund. There's other elements that are, that are going into that piece. Uh, so police and services, obviously public uh, safety being the largest majority and then all of the other departments uh, listed there as well. So the first department we're gonna go into is the city council department. And so uh, we're actually, I think Mike Sugg is on the line. So he's gonna go ahead and walk us through uh, this comparison. Great, thank you, Aaron, and good evening, Council. Uh, Mike Sugg, Senior Management Analyst in the City Manager's Office. Uh, as Aaron mentioned, I will take the next few slides here. We have the uh, City Council, City Manager Department, Legal and Human Services. In uh, the budget we're looking at here, your budget, there are three general categories of expenditures. We have personnel, supplies, and services. As Aaron mentioned, the columns of, columns of the table show the current 21-22 budget the proposed 2023-2024 budget, and then the uh, dollar change between the two. Uh, looking at the first line there for personnel, you will see an increase here, as well as in most other departments. And this is a result of the projected cost of living adjustment that the interim city manager talked about earlier that's been built into the base budget, as well as um, uh, projected cost increases for uh, city medical benefits. Um, so across departments, no matter if they're adding positions or not, we will be seeing increase in this personnel line just as a result of COLA and the uh, benefit increases. Because COLA, or excuse me, because council receives COLA, but not the full suite of employee benefits, the change that you're seeing here is primarily COLA related rather than um, being affected so much by benefits. Uh, looking at the services line, the increase is mainly a result of uh, new funding that's been earmarked to support council's goals that resulted from the uh, goal setting retreat a couple weeks ago. And we've plugged in uh, 100,000 per year uh, for any uh, outcomes of that uh, goals discussion. And uh, another increase under the services account was uh, we increased the city's contribution to the Kokanee work group based on their latest adopted budget and work plan that comes out in that uh, $23,000 over the biennium. And then we have a relatively small increase in dues for the Sound Cities Association of uh, 3,500 per year over the biennium. Uh, so that's kind of what's making up the, the bulk of the change here in the city council department, which is under the services section. Here we have the city manager's department. As you can see under the subheading, the department is made up of four areas, uh, administration, communications, the city clerk's office, and then new for this biennium, we have what we're calling, quote, general services. And I'll just explain very quickly. Uh, general services are the items 
that used to be located under the non-departmental department. Um, this department contained kind of the odds and ends that were considered more of a citywide rather than a department specific expense. And upon reviewing these non-departmental items, the interim city manager requested they be moved into their respective departments to ensure someone had oversight and responsibility for those areas. Uh, so as a result, you'll notice the city manager's office services budget is now relatively high compared to what you'd normally see in a city manager's office budget uh, because of some of these additional items that we've taken on. Uh, on the personnel side, there's an additional FTE showing, which is an administrative assistant in the city clerk's office. And while this is an addition to our department, it does not actually add to the overall headcount because this position was repurposed from a vacancy that was never filled in a different department. So we're seeing a, a, a plus one FTE ad here, but we'll see a corresponding minus one FTE ad in uh, other departments. There was a net decrease for services in the city manager's uh, department budget. This included a decrease in some project costs, such as the Bluma EIS project that was previously under that, or that is under that general services category I just covered. And then we have the website redesign that will be completed this year uh, that was previously budgeted under the communications department. So both the Bluma EIS and the website dollars were being shown in the current 21-22 budget. They're no longer needed in 23-24, which is why we're seeing um, uh, the majority of the de decrease we're seeing there. And these decreases were partially offset by cost increases for elections and voter registration under the city clerk's division uh, at about $185,000 over the biennium. There were also some increases in our communications division uh, of the city manager's budget to complete both a communication strategy and a statistically valid resident survey, both in 2023. But the magnitude of those increases were less than the decrease in the previously mentioned project costs. So Overall, we're still seeing a decrease in the services line. Regarding the COVID relief funds account, uh, this shows how much remains of the earmarked budget savings that were created by the uh, CARES Act funds. And this line does not include ARPA, uh, just to be clear. Uh, as Aaron mentioned earlier, those are accounted for in their own ARPA fund in our budget. And uh, just a quick note that we will be discussing this um, as well as the ARPA funds at our next budget meeting on September 27th, at which point we will have a uh, proposal for the use of these dollars. All right, moving on under legal, the biggest change you'll see in the proposed budget is the $1.2 million decrease in the services line. And this reduction is mostly coming from the contracted litigation account. Uh, we're proposing to reduce the contracted litigation budget to be more consistent with the actual expenditures we were seeing before the current biennium. Uh, the current biennium was a little bit of an outlier uh, when we went back and looked at the historic actuals. There were some small cost increases for certain contracted legal services, such as the prosecuting attorney and legal counsel for the upcoming labor negotiations. But these increases, uh, again, were much smaller in magnitude than the overall decrease in the litigation account, hence the overall decrease in the services line. One thing you'll see on the 27th is a recommendation from the city manager to move back to a contracted model for city attorney services. Uh, for quick background, this function was moved in-house for our current 21-22 budget, and the city did actually hire an in-house attorney for 2021 who has since left. Um, uh, and since that time, we've gone back to uh, the contracted model on an interim basis with Carrie Sand acting as our city attorney um, on an interim basis from the firm Ogden Murphy Wallace. And again, this is kind of a, uh, a, a preview of an item that will be coming on the 27th. So more to come there. Uh, the base human services budget remained fairly steady. There was a small increase in the amount of projected affordable housing sales tax that we'll collect in the next biennium which council previously chose to earmark for the city's Arch Housing Trust Fund contribution. So that's where that additional revenue will go. The grants are showing a little bit of a decrease here because in 2021, we had a one-time granting process that used carry forward funding, but the ongoing you know, biennial grant allocation has not changed between the bienniums in this base budget. However, again, previewing our meeting on the 27th, um, council will see a city manager request to increase 
on the 27th, the grant funding amount um, consistent with the forthcoming recommendation from the Human Services Commission. Um, so we're just looking at the, the base assumptions here with the, the extra decisions coming on the 27th. And then on the personnel side, our department had a 0.25 FTE vacancy that has never been filled. And this is being proposed to be reassigned to the Administrative Services Department, which you will hear about when Mark covers his Administrative Services Department slide. So with that, I think I will be turning it back over to Aaron uh, for police, fire, and finance. Thank you, Mike. So for police services, there's two elements of this budget within the general fund. The first one is our in-house city police services. So that's our personnel line there. That's the administrative staff that uh, police services has that is supplementing the King County Sheriff's Office contract. So the King County Sheriff's Office contract shows up in the services category here, cost category. So when we're comparing the budgets, that's 17.3 million that was adopted in the 21-22 budget and the 21.45 million that is in the proposed 23-24, that's a $4 million increase in the King County Sheriff's Office contract. So that reflects their uh, most recent proposal cost exhibit from the King County Sheriff's Office. You notice the substantial increase there, 4 million increase over two years, that is a two year period there. Uh, so one caution on that four million. So it's uh, mainly driven by some uh, labor costs. There's um, some additional activity related to uh, cameras and PRR uh, requests that would result from that, as well as additional litigation um, related to risk management on police officers. So some of the experience factors went up, so the insurance for officers went up, and that's a pass through to the contract cities. So those main three cost drivers were driving up the proposed costs that they have for the King County Sheriff's Office in total. So that's what the base budget reflects, is the same level of staffing that we had previously, and this is just the new base cost of that staffing based off of their estimates. I also wanted to note that for from an oversight or a governance standpoint, uh, the city manager serves on an oversight committee that's part of the King County Sheriff's Office contracts. So it has King County Sheriff's Office contracts with multiple cities. And so all of those um, city managers from those multiple cities get together and they form the oversight committee. So that's a uh, governance uh, body for uh, contract management on the King County Sheriff's Office. And then finance supports, there's a finance advisory committee um, that supports that oversight committee as well. Uh, okay, so fire services, uh, Eastside Fire and Rescue is the contract in the interlocal agreement. So this uh, proposal for the 18.4 million reflects their June uh, proposal that they uh, and discussion that they submitted at their finance and uh, their FAC meeting, Finance Administrative Committee. It's their advisory board to the EFER Governance Board. So this is, these numbers are reflected of that. Uh, some things to note here is in the 21-22 budget, the 16.2 million, they had suspended the fire fleet reserve contribution, as well as the fire maintenance contribution. So those two were suspended for the 21-22 period. Those are back in play for the 23-24, so their numbers include both of the fire fleet contribution and the fire maintenance contributions, in addition to the fire operating contribution. So those there's three components to that number, and that's all um, part of that uh, ILA costing estimate that they've proposed. From a governance stand, standpoint on this interlocal agreement, uh, it's set up a little bit differently in that there's two appointed council members that serve on the EFER board. Uh, so the EFER board has its own governance board over that organization, and then there's two appointed council members that serve on that board, and then their finance and advisory committee is a advisory committee to that board. So it's a little, little different setup than uh, the police services ILA. So just noting those differences there. Okay, for the finance department. Yeah, I know those people. Uh, so we're going from 3.17 million in 21-22 budget to the 3.5 million in 23-24. 
mainly that's your standard COLA and uh, medical plan assumptions for the personnel lines. The services line is increasing and that's due to the state auditor's office. Uh, every year evaluates the requirement for a federal single audit. And so based off of the city's receipt of federal funds, there's a threshold that needs to comply. And based off of that threshold, if you expend more than $750,000, which we are planning to do, then we would be subject to a, a federal single audit. And so that comes with a cost increase because uh, the city pays for the federal single audit. So it doesn't. Did you say we have to pay for them to audit us? That's correct, <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So that's the cost increase that's reflected in the services line there. And then merchant fees are a credit card processing fee. So this is largely your my building permit uh, fees that come through as people are reflective of permit activities and they're using their credit cards. So it's transaction based fees as those come through. So it typically follows activity levels. And so that's what we're projecting there is just the, the level of activity and the use of cards has increased Obviously that's a trend. Uh, there's more remote uh, activity uh, that's going on in the, and so those, the numbers reflect that. So that's um, anticipated to continue through the 23-24 period. And so that's where the merchant fees are reflected. So that is the finance department. And I think I'll kick it over to Mark. I hopefully Mark's on the line for admin services department. Good evening, council members. Mark Baird, Admin Services Director. And in the Admin Services Department, you'll see we have some increases in each of the three lines. You've heard a couple of the previous individuals talk about um, under personnel. In addition to the COLA uh, and benefit increases that others have mentioned, we do have an increase of one FTE. However, similar to how Mike talked about an increase on a previous slide, this is not a, a new element into the city. This is a, a redistribution of some available resources. So it's an addition to admin services, but not an addition into the city. I think as Mike noted, there's a 0.25 FTE of a management analyst that is joining a current 0.75 management analyst that was already in, in administrative services in order to create an FTE that we're in the process of filling. And there's a 0.75 FTE of the contract administrator that previously had been associated with a number of other departments over at the MOC that is coming over to admin services. And so putting those two together provides the net one new FTE into the department and thus shows the increase in the personnel cost. Under supplies, the increase represents the um, addition of three iPads to help us really facilitate new hire orientations and to bolster that experience. And under services, the additional funding is for primarily professional services for the class and comp study that I previously have talked about, some handbook revision work and some additional policy work um, all that stemmed from the previous HR assessment that I talked about last time I was here. In the risk management fund, um, you'll see a decrease in personnel. That personnel line is really the uh, unemployment benefits cost. And this is just um, our taking a look at how that, how those costs have gone over a series of years and making an adjustment um, down to a more appropriate size so that we're not just holding funds in that line. Um, under services, that represents the WCIA liability insurance premium. There were increases across the board in both years, and so that amount represents those increases for our insurance premiums. You'll notice in emergency management, there are some big changes in the lines. This represents uh, the change in the emergency management structure where we're shifting from paying for an FTE and some services to having uh, emergency management rolled into our larger agreement with EFER. And so the funding that was previously used for some of those services has been stripped out of here, leaving just the 
130,000 for some professional services work related to more Sammamish specific needs and supplies. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Council. Jim Hominick, IT Director for the City. Uh, I'm going to touch on a few areas. Obviously, you've heard this uh, broken record repeated with personnel costs. So there are increased personnel costs, COLAs, and, and benefits for the IT folks as well. Uh, in the service services area, our software licensing increase increases from the inflation factors has been, uh, let's just say, surprising. It is an average of about 12%. We've actually seen a few of our contract or licensing uh, arrangements increase. Uh, the highest watermark was 20% increase. So the IT industry in general has been uh, hitting us very hard. Uh, where we are uh, benefiting is by looking at our licensing and seeing where we can make some adjustments on that. Uh, but there are significant cost increases that are being passed along to us. Uh, a little bit different than some of the other areas is that our capital uh, budget is incorporated into our just our regular operating from a reporting perspective. And what those uh, increases reflect are uh, a couple of software, significant software upgrade projects that we're looking at in the next biennium. The iCompass system, which is your council uh, agenda management, is one of them. Uh, we thought we were going to be able to uh, look at an upgrade in, a, in this current biennium. However, we didn't. it wasn't forced upon us, so we hung back on that and did not. Uh, looking forward, the TrackIt system, which is the permitting system, which is primarily in community development, uh, we went through a minor upgrade that has been very painful for us in the IT side and much more painful in community development from a functional uh, perspective. We are anticipating that we'll have to reevaluate the use of that particular system and potentially look at a different solution from a, from a vendor. So that pretty much covers uh, uh, the, uh, the technology fund. Uh, good evening, Council. David Pyle, Community Development. For personnel, as you can see, the department has uh, 28.75 positions. I'm happy to say all department FT positions are currently filled. The increase in expenditure shown for personnel is due to inflation and cost of living adjustment, as previously explained by finance. It is important to note that many of the department staff positions are cost recovered through permit fees. So this number really is divided into two categories. The first category is those personnel positions that are fee recovered, such as permit review staff and inspectors. Those positions are primarily funded by permit fees, which is restricted revenue that must be spent only on permit related functions as dictated by state law. The second category are those positions that are funded from general fund dollars. This includes policy planners, analysts, and non-permit related administrative staff. It is important to keep this in mind as this single number does not tell a complete story about how the department is funded and how much of the department personnel expense is supported by general fund versus restricted revenue. For supplies, this modest increase is due to higher estimated costs as well as additional supplies for community meetings as we embark on the comprehensive plan update. The biggest category is services. This category is a mixed bag as many of the contracted services that fit in this category are cost recovered as pass through permit fees. So this number is not actually quite as big as it seems after you deduct contracted services that are cost recovered or are offset by grant funding. With this budget cycle and as presented at the July 12, 2022 city council meeting, the city is required to undertake several large policy planning efforts and much of this increase in cost comes from expense related to those projects which are not cost recovered and is funded by general fund dollars. The capital cost you see listed is a holdover from a past budget cycle and is due to incomplete vendor implementation of the city's permit software transition or upgrade as previously described by our IT director where we have withheld final payment as the terms of the contract have not been met. The revenue you see listed is based on forecasted development activity 
is also reflected of changes made to, reflective of changes made to the city's development permit fee structure that was recently overhauled and is now adjusted annually. We've made some big changes to how we collect permit fees. That's all for now. I'll turn it over to my parks counterpart. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Anjali Maya, Director of Parks, Recreation and Facilities. I have the next three slides. This first slide includes the operating costs for parks planning, recreation, parks maintenance, arts and culture, volunteer and the recreation divisions. As you can see, the FTE count is almost the same. The 0.25 is the contract administrator position that is shared uh, amongst our different divisions that is now uh, going to be uh, with the administrative um, services department. But you can see that the personnel costs, though the FTE count has not changed a whole lot, the personnel costs did go up significantly. In addition to the costs that the other directors have talked about, we found that um, in 21 and 22, uh, council had um, actually asked us to uh, reduce our budget by 6 million. And one of the things that were done as part of that exercise was that two FTE positions in um, full-time employees in our parks uh, crew, uh, we had a temporary um, hiring freeze and we did not backfill those positions. We also did not hire any recreation interns because of the pandemic. And so the costs reflected in 21-22 are a lot lower than they would have been if not for the pandemic. And so that's why you have the increase of uh, more than a million over there. And then the rest of the increases are in uh, professional services, which are going up in the park planning division because of the one-time six-year uh, parks recreation and open space plan update that we will be doing next year, as well as the anticipated increase in contracted services for recreation and maintenance. Next slide. This next slide represents the operating costs for the facilities division, which includes planning and maintenance of our facilities and irrigation across the city's parks, facilities, and public right of way. And here, the um, main increase in costs are uh, due to increase in costs of supplies, as well as some of those non-departmental uh, costs that have been transferred uh, two facilities for better tracking for building supplies. And then our professional services, such as our janitorial, are anticipated to go up per the CPIU. And lastly, the cost of repairs have gone up for fire safety and alarm systems, the elevator contract, and mechanical contract. And then I will mention that this base budget does not include anticipated repair and maintenance projects. So these numbers are slightly skewed. Uh, and those will be uh, shared as uh, part of the decision cards presentation on September 27th. Next slide, please. This is a summary of the fleet and equipment rental fund. And um, we had an, uh, uh, in our budget to hire a mechanic this year in 22. And so the personnel costs have gone up because we now have a full budget cycle for the mechanic in the next uh, budget cycle. And uh, in addition to that, um, you know, the hiring of the mechanic frees up our other MOC staff to do their work. So there are other benefits that come with hiring the mechanic. Our supplies are up by about 154,000, which are because of um, the supplies we need uh, uh, with the mechanic being hired this year. And this being the first year, those costs are a little higher. And then they are more than balanced by the reduction in repair and maintenance costs. And finally, the capital costs are based on scheduled replacement of fleet and equipment. And so this varies from year to year. And uh, we have a total of um, 11 uh, vehicles that are being replaced in 2023 alone. So that number is, uh, the change is uh, significant. With that, I will turn it over to the next, to Public Works. Thank you, Anjali. Good evening, Council. Audrey Sarsi and Acting Public Works Director. 
So um, again, broken record, most of our increases related to personnel are an inflationary increase due to COLA. We um, are actually seeing a, a slight decrease in some of our supplies. Most of our increases you'll see in this section are related to both services as well as capital. Some of the service increase includes um, the small wireless facility program, our solid waste contract support, the finishing the, the um, TIF update, the traffic impact fee update, and of course supporting the 2024 comp plan in um, this next biennium. Some of our increases to capital include um, primarily supporting our traffic signal workshop. So of the 26 traffic signals and 500 streetlights that we maintain, a lot of these have many components that require um, significant upgrades in the next few years. So that's a majority of the capital increase there. And I'll talk a little bit more in the next slide um, to pavement preservation and sidewalks. Thank you. Um, again, this will be coming back to you in our decision card discussions in the next few weeks, but just wanted to note that a majority of our pavement preservation costs are not included in this base budget. The amounts shown are only um, pertain to our 228th overlay that is scheduled to take place next year. And we'll go through different amounts um, that we could consider for funding for pavement preservation in the next few weeks. And we can also um, be, we'll be going through our sidewalk budget. Um, the, the sidewalk budget in the operations fund typically pertains to concrete work, um, ADA ramps that are required when we do an overlay. There are a few other areas in the capital programs when we come back and talk about the capital programs um, where we can fund sidewalks um, through the 340 fund. Next slide, please. And the uh, stormwater operating fund will go back in along with our rate study and our uh, draft stormwater capital improvement plan. We'll also be talking about the operating fund. This is, as um, Aaron mentioned in the introduction, this is a separate fund. This is fund 408. And the amounts shown here um, are more than likely to change, especially as um, we decide on a, a level of service that we select for the utility. So you'll see some um, preliminary increases to both personnel and supplies. Um, majority of our increases for service are smaller items, um, professional services, more engineering support needed um, for the utility. And again, a lot of our transfer to SWIM capital will be changing in the next few weeks as we refine our rate study costs and our capital plan. So with that, I will turn it back to Aaron. Yeah, uh, Mike, if you could go back a slide there on stormwater, I just wanted to make the distinction here. So this is the stormwater operating fund that's shown in this same table and format, but that's um, to be consistent with the general fund uh, other tables that were shown. But I do wanna highlight that this is obviously a separate fund, right? So the stormwater, there's an operating side to it, and this is the operating that's reflected on this slide. That's also why the transfers to stormwater capital is there, because there's a separate stormwater capital fund. So that transfer shows up in the stormwater operating side. So those two fund, funds function uh, in their own utility. So the stormwater operating and stormwater capital are grouped together and they're distinct from the general fund. So that's uh, kind of gonna be running a separate track as we go through the budget process, the stormwater, because you recall the stormwater rate study uh, is coming forward along the same track that we talked about in September 6 and the different rate options. So that'll be kind of a companion uh, track as we're going through the other general fund departments and those things. So then as we uh, wrap up our presentation, the next steps from here are, so September 27th, uh, Scott mentioned earlier, but just to touch on that uh, a bit more. So the 27th, we have scheduled to look over the decision cards. So any of those uh, additional enhancements or additions to the base budget. So we've seen everything that's included in the base budget it has been shown and presented tonight uh, for each of the departments. Uh, but those increases would then come on the 27th. The other piece that would come on the 27th as well is what Mike noted on the ARPA fund. So that's separate from the general fund, recall. So that fund and the plan for those uh, federal dollars, uh, as well as the COVID-19 um, relief funds that are uh, expanding into the 23-24, that 300,000 that Mike noted. So the plans for those are coming on the 27th as well. 
uh, along with the deci decision cards. And then October 4th, which is our third session on the budget workshops, uh, the intent there is to go and focus on the capital plans. So the capital funds, 301, 302, 340, that's the general capital, the parks capital, and the transportation capital funds are gonna look at and focus on the first two years of the, that planning horizon. So it's gonna look at what's budgeted in capital to occur during the 23-24 period. So it coincides with our total 23-24 preliminary budget. So after we've gone through all of those, we're looking to target uh, the city manager filing the preliminary budget document itself by October 14th. And the reason we're picking that date is because we need to uh, publish uh, public notice for two consecutive weeks prior to the first public hearing on the budget. And that first public hearing on the budget is scheduled for November. So that's why the timing is set to be to occur during that, that time frame. So that's kind of what's what's coming your way. All right, I'll turn it back over to Scott. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you, Aaron and team. Um, one thing I just do wanna note for council, you heard uh, uh, director is referring to decision cards. That's what they call the internal requests for additions to the budget as we review those. So uh, in two weeks when we come back, what you'll be hearing are the, um, the decision card, uh, in essence, the, um, the reasoning behind the request. Uh, that will we'll be bringing those to you all so you understand what is being proposed in the city manager's recommended budget to be added. Um, and so I think that will be a helpful conversation. I know it's helpful for me to read them and, and a lot of work goes into those. And so I think it's fair for you all to hear the same um, reasoning behind where the ad is coming from. And this will all, we will also get a little bit more into the, what reflects what the council goals that have been outlined and how we are trying to meet those with um, the current budget or what the proposed uh, additions will be. So just to give a little context and clarification for council. Um, with that, I know we spoke at you a lot this evening and I appreciate everyone um, staying with us. Um, hopefully you found that useful. I'm happy to open it up to questions at the moment. And again, I do want to clarify, you did hear from some department directors saying this base budget is a little bit misleading because what you will see with the proposed additions, things will look a little bit different. So I do want to make that designation and clarification, but we felt it really uh, helpful to give you the baseline first to then understand what's being added. So with that, Mayor, I'll turn it back over to you and open it up. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I don't know if we have that PowerPoint, but that was very nice. Those Excel spreadsheets intimidate me, but this was nice. This is super helpful, yeah, yeah. Uh, and to that end, Mayor, thank you. We will be, uh, apologize we didn't get the presentation out ahead of time, no we will problem. be sending it out, yeah. but we were, as of this afternoon, uh, making last minute adjustments to it, so. Yeah, it seems like you guys rehearsed it. You went very well and smooth yeah. through transition, so I appreciate that. All right, Council, I will open it up for questions. Councilmember Howe. Awesome presentation, Tr terrific, really, really strong. On slide 23, there was a discussion of $150,000 for emergency services, and where I'm confused is who would direct that funding? Um, exactly because we don't have an emergency services manager in-house. Would EFER do it? Do you guys, who does it? Uh, thank you, council member. Uh, I can clarify that one. I believe you're talking about the emergency services um, slide. Yeah, it was for $150,000. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, so, uh, thank you, Mike. Um, so I have tasked the administrative services director, I've asked, uh, Mark to be responsible for emergency management here in the city. And so this is, um, this reflects, that's why Mark was giving the presentation. This reflects that um, uh, Mark is taking, taking over that component in-house, recognizing that we have also have some, um, um, the EFER is offering us some broad level services and Mark is working on our in-house plan. Uh, and so okay. we will be coming back to you and that's why some of those dollars are in there is to actually go out and bring in some consultants to help oh. bring some of our plans up to speed. And then we'll be coming back to you once we 
have some more information. Um, but in the meantime, we do have an in-house plan and we will be bringing that to you about how we respond to our, what I would consider our normal regular emergencies. So uh, from that standpoint, I would call those windstorms, um, snow, ice, all that yeah. kind of stuff. I just, yeah, I sensed a gap. So thank you for that. I have one last question and, and I think it's maybe the slide prior. It's about uh, police services. Thank you. On this one, um, when we do a contract with the sheriff's department, do we, if, if there's a, a, a reason for say overtime services, do they, who, who eats that cost? Because how does that work? So in the contract itself, the interlocal agreement assumes a certain amount of overtime assumed. budgeted. Okay. And then the use of overtime is approved as you know, as needed, pre-approved prior to use. So those those costs are approved locally. So we would approve the use of that overtime for those types of costs. Typically related to special events is where our overtime costs come into play. So July 4th, for example, would be an example of when we'd have discretionary overtime use. For normal overtime, uh, that would be more of the operational issue for that the police chief would manage within the, the staffing resources that he has in order to maintain minimum levels of staffing for the force that's uh, in service. Okay, terrific. Uh, the other thing is I'd just like to get a sense from the staff, just like, are people just feeling like I can just barely get stuff done with, if, you know, it, are we on the edge? <laughs> it's so hard with FTE stuff to, balance how much is contractor, how much is FTE, and to get the, the the level of work and the quality of work that you want. I mean, I know everyone's very experienced in their role and thank goodness for that. So they're able to do these kinds of projections, I think very capably. But I, I don't sense any sandbagging, I think. Uh, thank you, council member. I, I would concur. Um, what I would say is I think one of the slides that Aaron put up there was the, the, the sort of our model and, and that, you know, we have, uh, thank you, Mike, um, that, that supplemental staffing and contracts and then the core contracted services, that's the piece where we are set up to be, we have some amount of, um, capacity in-house and then we are de by design set to go outside of house for anything above that. Okay. So to answer your question, we do have a lot of capa capacity in-house, but we have that all programmed out. So the things that come on top of that, then we go out of house to find that support. Okay, thank you very much. Councilmember Stewart. Yeah, um, one question, uh, you gave us the dates for the I think it was November 14 was the uh, date for us to approve that. Um, is there, or November 15, sorry. Uh, what is the, the date where we have to, because I know there's a drop dead date when we got to get this submitted to the state. What's that date? Yeah, so it kind of depends. So the budget ordinance has to be adopted by the end of the year. But of course, the budget ordinance includes your property tax ordinance right. and final action on that. So that the property tax ordinance has to be submitted to King County, and that has to be done by the end of November. Got it. Okay. So we don't a, have. Just, some other I just want to be clear pieces. to people: yeah. there's not a lot of room in here because there's a little thing called Thanksgiving in November as well. Um, so if we don't want to be doing a lot of meetings over holidays, um, I just wanted to kind of call that out that while, I, one, I appreciate getting this early and I appreciate having this schedule. Um, it's a lot, um, but we really do have to stay on top of it. One thing that would help me, um, if it's possible, but um, I know we have the, the high uh, cost of living adjustment that we're contending with in this budget cycle. But I noticed just doing the quick math in my head that many of the increases were well above, in some cases double uh, the, the COLA. So where you saw personnel, where you didn't see the number of FTEs increasing, uh, in some cases it decreased, but the personnel cost went up 20% instead of 10%. percent i just like to get a sense of that. Is that just, you know, kind of your normal like, oh, in addition to a cost of living increase, sometimes people get like raises, go figure. Um, but I just want to get a sense of that. If, that, if that's what's going on or if there's anything else, because when I see those sort of like, I was expecting it to be about 10%, but it was 20 instead, that, that sets off an alarm bell in my head. Right, so 
Yes, it, this is all reflective of base budget. So existing staff, but of course we've had turnover in staff. So placement at different levels coming in. So that changes over that four year comparison period that you're looking at. So recall you're looking at 21, 22. So the personnel costs in 23 and 24, or 24 is four years later. Got it. Right. So there is four years of increase in that net delta that you're looking at. Uh, so, but inflation is the primary component of that, uh, tied into the the COLA adjustments that were outlined. That 4.7 percent is the four-year average for 2023. The other caveat that I will mention on personnel costs 2024 is an estimate. So the the collective bargain agreement goes through 2023. Got it. So it will need to be bargained for 2024. Excellent. We we'll have a whole couple of pages of questions. I will send those an email. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Councilmember Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> Deputy Mary Lamb. I just have a few questions. Um, on the city council slide, there was um, a mention of the Kokanee work group contribution. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, the Kokanee work group is, um, it is a is set up as an ILA that each member organization contributes to because there is a staff member at King County that is funded by that organization to do the actual work. So that's what that reflects. Okay. Um, for services, when we hire contractors, um, say from like Robert Half, is that under personnel line item or is that under services? It's gonna be under services because that's a contract. So Robert Half is a, a firm that we're contracting with for uh, supplying different services across the city. Okay. And then for just like more detailed line items, um, say in services or anything, will we see those details? Because this is pretty broad. Yes, yeah, so we're looking <laughs> <laughs> We're just looking at the broad uh, comparison of the base budget here. So there is a, a detailed line item view. Yeah. And appreciate that you're wanting to see that. Most people. <laughs> I just want to know what's to come. What's, what, uh, yeah. I just think we're going to have to help the mayor through that because that's like a lot of spreadsheets. So. <laughs> yes, but we do have it. Yes. So that's in the next couple of weeks? Or yeah, so months? we would have to build, so based on the base budget approvals, and then as we get direction on any ads, so those all have to be incorporated into the BARS classification system, which does require an account number for all of that. So that all has to be lined out at the detail line item at a level. So that would be what would be part of that city manager filing of the prelim budget. So that's when that document is produced at the line item level. Okay, thanks Aaron. Yep. Uh, Councilmember O'Farrell. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just had a quick question. I noticed we have um, $300,000 remaining from COVID funds. Um, what exactly can they be spent on? And the reason that I ask that is that I also noticed that our Human Services Grants Fund is decreasing um, by a smaller amount. And I wonder, is that, is that possible that that can be used in that way or they have to be very specifically spent? Uh, Councilmember, I'll take that one, and, and I know Mike can uh, can answer this one. However, uh, I think you are are foreshadowing what is to come. If I may be so bold, um, you are seeing the base budget uh, biennium over biennium. You're not seeing proposed what are uh, what I was just describing as the decision cards or the city manager's recommended increases. So those will come in two weeks, and I think that you will find that that those dollars will be attributed to. Uh, an increase in human services funding. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Stewart. I just wanted to um, throw in there that part of the reason, if I, if I understand correctly, that you're seeing what looks like a decrease is because in 21 and 22, we actually did a bunch of um, grants to human services through the CARES Act funding. So the, the money there is actually higher than what we would normally have done because we did do a round of grants from CARES Act. So just. Uh, to be very specific, I believe that was the uh, helping with rent for certain folks at the, and I am 
I will apologize up front. I'm blanking on the name of the apartment complex that's just next to uh, Klahani. Highland Gardens? Yes, I think that's correct. So that was council approved 60000 to do that. I think that's that direct amount. Councilmember Indipure. Thank you. Um, so two couple questions. I know uh, police and fire expenses have gone up. Um, and I think, you know, it had a little explanation. I'm also wondering, was that in part also because of uh, bargaining agreements? On, on Because I know fire and police also have their unions. So I was just wondering if that was there. And then uh, for legal services, um, uh, I, I know our costs are going to go down. And then that, that was, um, I know it was mainly because we were getting counsel in-house. Um, but I think going in, um, into our next meeting, I, I'm also curious to know some more details around uh, the, the sort of uh, other thinking that has gone into uh, bringing down our legal services and liabilities as well. I think it cut out. I didn't quite hear. So I can go ahead and okay. respond on the the first part there on police and fire. So yes, fire. Uh, so they're in a, a currently bargained environment. So that reflects their um, cost proposal estimate. Uh, the police contract, King County Sheriff's Office, is currently bargaining uh, with their members. So this is a pure estimate as far as those labor costs that they've incorporated into their cost exhibit. So once that labor agreement finalizes, then we would have to um, potentially retro back to whatever the uh, final negotiated agreement amount is. For, uh, Thank police. you. Uh, for legal services, that's a decision card that's coming back. Uh, so you'll see that the next time we have, that, that there's actually a specific card on legal services. Uh, so it's kind of foreshadowed here, I think. Uh, or you know the city manager's proposal, so that's just highlighted. But you'll get more details on the twenty seventh when that's talked about in more depth. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> All right, are there any other questions? Yeah, thank you. This is so, so helpful to have this early on. So I really appreciate all the work. Um, is that? Uh, just one more thing, if, if I may, uh, as you have questions, and I know you will, please send them in whenever, and we'll start aggregating those and be uh, try to get answers out ahead of time to the extent that we can. Um, and I know we, we, we sent a lot at you. We will get the presentation out to you. Um, I'll just ask Mike to send it out, and that way you'll have the slides. If you have uh, follow-up questions, please feel free. This is one of the reasons for doing it this early is to try to get all these questions out there and on the table. Um, um, Mayor, if I just may take a quick moment. Um, I just want to share out that uh, former Mayor Malchow um, sent a note to me that a, a former Mayor Ken Kilroy passed away. He was one of the first council member on the first council after the city incorporated, uh, and he was deputy mayor and then mayor in his term on council that ended in 2003. So just wanted to note that uh, a former mayor and council member had passed away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think we'll move to council reports. Um, Deputy Mayor Lamb, I believe you had a verbal one. Yes, um, on Wednesday, I won't be able to attend the public issues committee meeting and alternate, um, the alternate uh, council member train will be attending in my place, but I will need somebody else to attend as a attendee. And that's on Wednesday at seven o'clock, if there's anybody else that can attend. Is that tomorrow? Yes. 7 p.m.? 7 p.m. Hmm. Just say I might be able to do it too. Okay, that would be great. I'll just- I don't um, remember how. I'll just get you the link. Okay. Cool. Um, there's a few topics that will be up for discussion, and apologies, I didn't get this into a written council report. Um, the first one is that the SCA, they'll be appointing um, 
um, people to the regional boards and committees in late fall of this year, and the staff will be briefing the public issues committee on the process and answer questions. Um, they will, there will also be a discussion on the 2023 SCA state legislative agenda. Um, they're starting to put together their legislative agenda, so member cities um, will be sharing um, topics and our legislative agendas or top issues. And since we haven't met um, as a council to, to decide what our priorities are, um, council member train will be going in and sharing some of our council goals and mentioning that you know more will be coming from Sammamish. Uh, there is a topic that um, on commercial aviation capacity. Um, so the the SeaTac and Payne Field is projected to um, have. They're projecting capacity to be at 55.6 million. That's for passenger boardings, um, which is um, more than um, they have um, allowed for. So they need to find a new, need to expand um, aviation capacity. And that would possibly include um, looking for um, a new area for an aviation facility, and they're looking in South King County. And so there are member cities that have written in that that is not something that they want um, in their location due to uh, land use and um, environmental impacts. So there'll be a discussion on, on commercial aviation capacity. And also the lastly, um, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and there's a discussion on what cities are doing um, for that. Great, thank you. Um, does anyone else have one? I do have, oh yeah, go ahead. Um, first of all, just uh, thanks to Doug and his team for showing up for the uh, Eastside Transportation Board meeting, because that they do such a great job with the notes. Um, the, the main gist, I think, that came out of that meeting was the PSRC um, announcements of who was getting funding for different projects. And we had applied for some grants and, we're, and we're, did not get any. And we think that the chief reason for this was probably because we had nothing that was shovel ready, that was ready to go. And so everyone else's projects, um, they may or may not have had a bigger regional impact, but to be honest, they were literally ready to go and we just didn't have anything that was that far along in our in our process but um, it was a really good thing to just listen to to see what kinds of projects to get funded I think we're going to be in a much better position going forward now as we understand how these things how some of these work and um, again just really sound job with their notes and I, uh, you have them as a council but they also sent out some additional slides that I'll forward to you later on Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I'll get a written report out. We did have the EFER meeting, um, and I will encourage uh, Mayor Yu had sent out uh, before the last EFER meeting the agenda. Um, and I know pr previously we've uh, received the budget from EFER, so that kind of ties into our conversation here. I encourage council members to go and take a look at that. Um, if you have any questions, please do raise them sooner rather than later um, because all these budgets have to get approved and, and everything. Um, so there's not a lot of, well, it feels like there's a lot of time. There's not really a lot of time. Um, specifically in the EFER agenda to look at uh, is the strategic plan, um, and that is why I'll I'll create a, an official report so it can get attached to the agenda next week so that the public can see it. Um, and that is also something that EFER is asking for feedback on is um, their strategic plan. So I'll get that out. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, and then I just wanted to mention one last thing, the progress flag mosaic unveiling. It is ready. It is finished. Anjali or Scott, maybe you can answer. Is it at 430 or is it at 5 in City Hall tomorrow? There's two different... Uh, I think it's I'm, five. I'm going to defer to Anjali. <laughs> okay. Hopefully you're still here. It's, oh. it's 5 p.m. Five. Yeah. Inside City Hall? Uh, yes. And actually, cool. uh, yeah, the doors will be open, the side doors, onto the market. So Perfect. people can walk through even from the market. Okay. And I will be here, and I hope everyone can be here. So, and that is all. Yes. 
Sorry, I have one, one more item um, as it uh, relates to the legislative agenda, um, because we don't have enough going on with you know the budget um, <laughs> and other things happening. Um, it is best if we can develop our legislative agenda um, soon again sooner rather than later so that we can begin to have conversations with some of our um, representatives before they go back to Olympia in January um, and we do have um, uh, our uh, crack team of lobbyists that help us with that um, I have found it, personally just in my opinion that our legislative agendas have been best put together and have landed the best when we've had a legislative committee. Um, and so um, I'd like to throw out there, we don't have to decide tonight, but maybe we can throw it on the agenda for next week, that we form an ad hoc legislative committee um, to in part pull some of that workload off of staff while they are busy doing a lot of other things. The legislative committee can meet with the lobbyists and put together ideas uh, to bring forward to the council. Obviously, our legislative um, priorities are all approved by the, the council, you know, the committee of the whole, uh, but it does help to kind of banter about what, you know, looking at our council priorities and what we believe the, the legislative agenda will look like to be able to align those things and come to get, come forward with some proposals. So that's something that I would love um, to throw on next week's count, uh, agenda to discuss so we can get moving on that. And our lobbyists do a really great job. Um, obviously, Mike Sugg does as well if he's still around um, at pulling together the, the one pager, but I just think getting some of that legwork done um, ahead of time would really help. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. I think it's a long session next year too, right? So it's like double the work. I think that's it, unless you have anything, Scott? Cool. All right, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. All right, 7-0, we are adjourned. I hope to see you soon, Ratuja. Thank you all. <laughs> Good night. I'm flying out tomorrow morning, so yeah, I'll be there soon. <laughs>